moment. Oh, that's um, Liam, it's okay. Now we'll get rid of that. So, any questions on that one, guys? The first one always used to be the Safeway, It used to be the Safeway Wally, that's right. So I'm saying if you haven't met it for a few months and that's the direction your path you normally would take, it's not the right way at the moment. <laughs> and then, of course, on the north side, it's even worse because it's. And it's actually uh, where the north wall is, that bank's actually trajectorying uh, southeast at the moment. It's actually building up out wider as you go out further. So it's not a clean slate straight out through there either. It actually comes across a bit too. So you've got to go out about 200 metres past the, the north wall, uh, or 150 metres, and then dog leg southeast, even if you're going to go north. Yeah. Okay, welcome along tonight. I'm Dougie Burt. This is Stuart Grice, and we've got many other staff here that are help, here to help you out. And tonight we're going to teach you as much as we know about mackerel fishing and how to do it and uh, try and improve your catches, that's what it's all about. So the last few people that have been here, um, they're probably maybe watching tonight, I don't know, but um, a lot of those people are getting mackerel, which is really great to see. And, and uh, we had a, a bit of a comp um, with, the with them on some of the lures and stuff, and they've sent in a photo. They attach it to the last, um, uh, last time we advertised the seminar. So same for you guys tonight, you've all got a hard body lure in your bag there. So if you get a, a um, fish on it, can you please take a photo with the lure and then just post it onto the last posting of this se of this tonight's seminar. And then we'll do a draw out. There's, there's a big bunch of lures and stuff you can win, okay? And you've got till the end of March, I think it is. Yep. End of March to um, to do that. So get, get out there, depending on the weather. <laughs> Will we get out there between the end of March? I don't know. If we don't, we'll extend it. But... Um, the weather's uh, last weekend, or last Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday was so-so. Monday was good, and Tuesday morning was okay, didn't come bad. But that's the best weather we've had since, as we all know, since before Christmas. So at least it was good to see a bit of weather, but it wasn't long enough, of course. Now it's terrible. I feel that today is 40 knots in, in certain times. And then we got a lot of rain. The rain for the mackerel, what does it do? Okay, two things. If it, if the mackerel are on the top, they're not on the top this year, they're down deep, which is a good thing for us. So normally they're on the top, you get the big skills of spotties and all the bait and everything's on the top. The problem is um, if we get a lot of rain, it changes to dirty and they just get out of that dirty water. They don't go deep, they go wide and go down the highway and maybe stop where it's not raining down at Nambucca Heads or somewhere way down south or southwest rocks or way, way down. So. Um, but this year, the, the fish are all deep. They're sitting down about 20 metres or deeper. So they don't really give a crap about what's up there. As long as the water temperature's the same, the bait's the same, and the clarity's pretty good in that depth, they're happy. So let's hope we don't get big lots of rain, but I think it'll be no problems for what, what we're experiencing at the moment. So next time we go back out, they should still be there. Uh, mackerel hang around to, I've got Spanish mackerel to August and spotties to August, but generally speaking, it's around about May, June at the latest. Um, it's Queen's birthday, is probably more of the latest in June, the old Queen's birthday that is. Um, and uh, the water temperature once it gets below about 21, they just disappear. They go north again, or out that way. So that's all based on water temperature. As the mackerel, they do go south further, and they're getting caught south further as we speak now, as well as here, and also getting caught north further too. So Sunshine Coast, they're having a, a field day at the moment. So those fish will keep coming down and they keep going past us, they stay here, they keep going south. Then once it gets too cold down south in about a month's time, they'll start coming back the other way. Then we get a second hit of the mackerel, spotties and that, and the bigger fish too, by the way. Well, the fish at the moment aren't too bad. So the average uh, Spanish demand is about eight kilo and there's a few 12s, a few 15s, a couple of 20s, um, and a lot of big ones that you can't stop. Has anyone been done big time yet at the front here? You have, yeah, yeah. Okay, a couple of years have. I know we have. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and there's a lot of Wahoo. The Wahoo are very early this year and, and big numbers. So like, um, we lost, uh, you know, went out Thursday morning, Thursday afternoon, Friday morning, Monday morning, lost four lures. I lost two, uh, two or three lures on the Thursday. I uh, won on Friday. Yeah. I won on Monday with my friend. So we lost five lures actually. Yeah. So um, uh, it, there's nothing to do about it. Two of those bite offs were way up above the trace. They're like those biting the swivel or whatever it might have been. Or well, the knot, actually one was bitten at the all bright, at the um, wind on leader knot. So it's just bad luck. And it's very quick, it's, and it's just loose, you wind in the loose line, <laughs> re rig. So anyhow, um, the good thing about bait fishing is you don't get as many bite offs. They will, I did get a bit, actually I lie, that 
two weeks ago I was out yeah. trolling and um, I had to go, eh, and then I thought, oh, it's going to come back and come back. I waited, waited, waited. And I wound in and the trace was bitten. There's um, wire, 58 pound single strands, about long. And it's clean in half, so it's a wahoo again. Because Spanish mackerel don't bite the wire as easy as wahoo do. Um, very rare. They bite above it or, or near it, but not uh, through it so much. So, anyhow, we we'll get to the bait side of things. So, we're going to go through the gear, um, rods and reels, same scenario, both types of uh, fishing for mackerel. Um, and then it's going to tell you about braid versus mono for trolling, and um, that also includes bait trolling as well, and then um, pitching baits and stuff like that. Um, we'll show you what you use to rig up, and then we'll then do the hard bodies after that. Still, that's what I do. It. Yeah. So um, with the gear, guys, uh, I'll use anything. I'll use whatever I can find in my, in my shed or whatever I grab out that's closest to me, that's not tangled up. That goes fishing with me for the day. So I don't have my full set of mackerel gear, perfect, well, we should have, but I don't have <laughs> So, but our idea is to test anything, to so say you guys, when we sell it to you, we know it works, okay? So whether it be a cheap, crappy combo or a very expensive Tiago or Talika combo, um, we use right through the whole range sort of thing. So it all works. Um, just some will break and some doesn't break, but most of the stuff is pretty good. So I think from a TLD combo and above is good, okay? That's in your, in your overhead gear. Um, and in your spin gear, um, say anything from a, uh, like for spinning I've used Sedona's and, and Smash, Spotty Mackerel and Spanish Mackerel on it. And they're only a $100 reel if that, you know. Um, but you don't lock your drag it right up. You, you, everything's um, adjusted to, this, to the quality of the gear and the size of the line that you're using. Um, so we'll talk about spinning in, in a moment. But Stuart, what would you use out of that stuff in the lighter gear, mate? Like in the lighter gear, I use very lucky. Yep. Um, fish like get the bite. Um, like that's a general bit of float line in, bit of spinning type rod. I mean, you throw little stick baits and stuff like mm. that, maybe a little bit of light trolling. It's just a little 4,000 reel, um, and I think it's a 5 to 8 kilo rod. But very universal. Mm. So, yeah. so that type of one I'd be definitely using for float lining for, for spotties. Um, I'd also use it for spinning metals for um, spotties, which we'll talk about a bit later. Uh, and definitely, um, and, and catch a Spanish on as well. Um, we'll also talk about with bait fishing, about how we anchor up at um, certain times, particularly a bit later, around about sort of April. We do a lot of anchoring up for, for Spanish and that, and spotties, mainly Spanish, out on the Diamond Reef, and you burly up heaps, and you run, um, they tend to go on live baits or pillies more than anything else at that time of the year. And uh, I run liveies down low, and I run, like pillies on gangs, sort of mid-water, and then I'll, um, I'll be spinning the burly trails while I'm doing all that. And uh, you get, obviously, it's Spanish mackerel spotted, and you'll get uh, yellowfin tuna as well. You don't get many um, spotties out on the 24s, but I have caught them out there quite a few times. They're predominantly 18 and closer. And Spanish mackerel don't really go past 50 metres on the Gold Coast in depth. That's where they stop. Um, I have caught a spotty at 50 metres at the FAD, actually, once out from me a couple of years ago in comp in January. Um, but generally speaking, they don't go past 40 metres or 38 metres. That's their cut-off line. But you go to North Queensland, they'll go out all the way to the Barrier Reef. They'll swim through 300 metre deep of water. But it's just this area. That, I don't know what it is. They, they must know from from past. I don't yeah, know what like it is. Yeah, follow the coastline down. Yeah. They don't really go wide. A bit scary for them. Uh, a lot of sharks this year too, guys. They haven't been sharked yet. Fishing for mackerel. Okay, there's a lot of sharks. Yeah, anyhow, talk about that a bit later as well. Um, what else have we got there, Stuart? Uh, Next size so up. Going up in size. Yeah. So. So that's like a bit of a slow pitch. Did you bring any jigs up there? I didn't know. I haven't got time no, to talk no. about today, yeah. You can slow pitch jig for yeah. Spanish and stuff like that, particularly when they're down very deep. Um, so, like a grappler combo, it's fairly high up there in quality, but you can use it for trolling, mm. um, a bit of casting, a bit of jigging as well, bait fishing, yep. kind of does it all. Yeah. And that's just a strategic SW, so nice and tough, very robust reel. It's a reel that you buy once and it lasts a long time, not just a season. Yeah, so that type of outfit there, guys, it'll do everything. It'll, uh, you can fly along with it, you can troll um, deep divers with it, that sort of size. Um, definitely troll baits with it. Uh, for Spanish mackerel, and you can jig with it, and as Stewie said, um, it sort of does everything, light bait as well. Uh, and that one you'd be running around about 50 pound braid on, okay? 
but a very thin 50 pound braid. And the next one up, Stewie. Just to, if you've got stuff in this size, guys, we're trying to tell you what you can use and what not to use, okay? So this is kind of just a light trolling type setup. So I think we've got 15 kilo mono on it. Um, it's a little Speedmaster 16. Um, very easy to use. It's two speed. Not that you need a two speed reel for the mackerel, but sometimes it does help. And um, yeah, it's just a straight runner rod, no roller tip or anything on this one. So it's mm. very basic. Yeah, so when you're trolling a rod on this one, even with the mono, you'll see a little bit of movement. Um, the difference between trolling mono and trolling braid, I would like to troll braid these days. Um, I believe on both the bait and the lure that the action's a lot more aggressive um, and allows your lure to swim a lot better. So when it's on braid, it's like, it's like doing that in the water when you're trolling. And when you're trolling um, with mono, it's, as I said, it's, just, it's not moving much at all. So I think it restricts the movement, but I know it's taken out, the shock's taken out along the length of the line, but I definitely believe braid's more uh, more aggressive to get a better a better um, tune to your baits and lures and stuff. And with it being so much thinner, you get your lures will deeper. go a lot deeper, mm. less drag in the water, mm. and um, you still run a medium sized leader, but not massive. And then that's like a heavy trolling type yeah. setup. So it's a Speedmaster 25, very similar to like a TLD 25. Um, and yeah, fully rolled rod. So it's pretty extreme, but it's more of a Marlon combo, mm. but um, if you've already got one, you can definitely catch a few yeah. shots. So what we're going to hear is, yeah, it's exactly yeah. right, Stuart's saying, if you've got like a Tiago 30 wide or a Pan 30 wide or 50 is a bit big, guys, if you're honest with you, but if you want to have a shot, you can throw it out, it's up to you guys. Um, but anything up to about a 30 wide is about the max you want to use in size. Okay, you get guys will take their 80s and go mackerel trolling because they've got the rods and reels, but it's not really much sport for the fun of it, if that makes sense. Yeah. Yep. Well done, mate. yeah, so yeah. That's, that's sort of about it. And the only other rods we use are Sabiki rods, so I don't know, because we're getting live bait, um, how many guys used these things before? Has anyone, ever not, has anyone not seen these before? Okay, so how they work is, um, when you run a bait jig on, um, we could probably set one up while we're, while we're talking, we'll do it a bit later yeah, though. Yeah. yeah, but uh, the line passes in here, it goes up the centre of the rod, and you tie on your bait jig here, right? And you got your bait, your sink on the end of the bait jig, whatever it might be, a quarter ounce, four, a four, oh sorry, a four ounce um, sample or whatever. And um, they, they're very sensitive. They, they look thick as, as as ever, but they are thick as ever. But they still bounce around when you get the bait on. You still feel them away. And um, when you get the bait off at the end of the day, you just wind the bait jig up internal, and just your sink is hanging at the end here, and you can throw it in the cabin or throw it wherever you want. And it doesn't get tangled and you don't have to cut off your jig and throw it away because you know it's going to get tangled somewhere you're going to waste it it's in there it's hose it having it home um, and there's two sizes and that that one takes up to a size six bait jig yep. and the blue one will take up to about a four or two i think it is it's two, size two which is like big slimy size or um, tail or whatever big bigger size which they go for? uh they're about with you with they're the, there's two grades there's a javis walk by myself for about 59 bucks and that one's with the discount comes back to about 80, 80 bucks, five, 85 yeah. or something like that. Yeah. They're about 100 and something bucks, yeah. 85. But they're really good. You just throw in there an egg beater or an, a little overhead, whatever you got, doesn't matter. And uh, braids preferably to go, coloured braids definitely to go, okay? So um, we might as well do this part while we're here. Yeah. So if you all know about um, when you, who, who's not caught live bait before offshore? Okay, you should get into it maybe, and, and yourself too, mate, it's, it's very good. Um, definitely here catch a bigger fish and uh, and use it for everything from catch and snapper, jewies, kingies, amberjack to obviously mackerel. Okay, so um, that's your, your screen on your sounder, and uh, this is the bottom here, like so. Oops, not like that one. It's invisible bottom that one. Like so. Sorry, guys. Can you see her there? Okay, mate. Yep. So it comes along my little pinnacle there, a little bit more there. A big one here, and your bait's going to be. Is it red one here, some mystery. Oh, here it is, mate. And your bait's going to be sort of sitting on there, and it might get inside. It might just be a bit on the bottom here above that, and your bait's like that. But your depth will be like, um, say, in meters, say 10, 20, 30, 40 meters, and obviously 50 down there. And the bait's at about 25 metres. So what you do is, um, you, with the coloured line, you sort of, you just, it's coloured every 10 metres, so it's easy. So what a lot of people do is they'll drop their bait jig all the way down to the bottom, 
fast and then they'll jig it back up through the bait. That's what most people do, right? Um, but you get a lot more bait if you actually work your bait jig down rather than up. And how you do that is you run, you know, 10, 20, 25 metres is sort of the zone. So at two colours out, which is 20 metres out, you're just about to go through the first top layer of the bait. And what you do is you, um, as the bait going out through the rod with the four ounce snuffle, it's going pretty quick. You just keep, grab it, let it go, grab it, let it go, grab it, let it go. Just let it bounce down through it and it loads up. By the time you see here, you've already, you've already loaded up and it goes loose. And obviously you've got to start winding them up while it's a little tangled up. So work your, work your bait down through it. I don't think I've really ever got to the bottom of not having to pull it back up already. So if you try and pull it up, if you try and get the bottom up, upwards, you will get bait, don't get me wrong, but you're trying to direct the slack with the tension of the synchron, it doesn't really work too good, and they want the slack. That's what makes it work. So every time you grab it and it's free falling, it, it gets slack for a second. That's when, they, that's when they pounce on it, you know. So just try that next time. But you need the colour line to know where you are. Really important. Okay. Yes, mate? One of the things with those, with those rods, when you, when you clean your gear and put a hose down, yep. you've got to turn them upside down. I'll say drain it. Don't, yeah. don't, don't put them away vertical because water sits in the bottom 400 mil what? of the tube. So what normally happens there, Wally, is we sell another bait because they go rusty. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. It's all right, mate. Don't worry about it. <laughs> so, yeah, so, so just, just try it. Yeah, no, but you're right. You've got to drain it back out. So it's a logical thing, but definitely, yeah. The best thing is actually to drop your bait jig out and wash the bait jig and then just wind it back inside, yeah, but definitely. But try that next time, guys, okay? Um, I'll get rid of that one real quick. And so even if they are right on the bottom, as Doug said, yep. they like flat lines. Slack. So you see heaps of guys and they just jig like very like mechanical, it's like up and down and that's it. Yeah, yeah. Hardly any, but if you drop it down and jig flat line, um, you yeah. smack them. Yeah, if they're yeah. actually hugging the bottom, don't actually lift the sinker off the bottom. Give it your rod length another, that length of slack, and just direct the slack. Okay. Sorry guys, we're just trying to cram everything that we know in, in tonight, so as we go along, we'll, we'll keep giving you ideas. Um, let's do it, so we've done the rods and reels, yep. um, the line, okay. Um, with the braids and line, so as Stuart said before, 15 kilo mono is our biggest selling trolling line. How many people do you troll with mono? Okay, a couple of you do. Do you guys... Yeah. Very, if you give in, you yeah. don't pull many hooks out, but your lures, dive-in-wise, don't work as far. That gives the other thing. And have you guys ever tried troll and braid at all before? Yep, okay, and how'd you go with that? All right? Okay. okay. You'll have three, you'll have two, mono and one yep. braid. Yep, yep. So and we sometimes do the same, we'll have a mono and braid out as well. Yep. Um, and there's no drama with trolling both of them together. Um, the only drama you have is if you get a fish on the braid that runs over the top of the mono or braid, it'll cut the other one off if your fish goes across. Um, the thing is, though, when I'm trawling, I'm trying to um, keep my other baits or, or lures in the same zone. So I, um, jumping ahead of the queue here, but <laughs> when you hook a fish up, right, so when your ratchet's going, rah, rah, screaming off, right, and you're doing six knots, say you're trolling hard body lures, um, you should just coolly <laughs> grab your throttle and pull it back to about two knots. And so you're still going forward, so don't pull it back real quick because just that real quick can actually make the hook come off the lure. I've had hooks in me and I don't know how they get off the hooks, but they do get off the hooks. <laughs> and uh, the second thing is, um, then you're travelling at two knots. Um, if you've got a, we've had, we had triple hook up the other yeah. day, twice, um, and we had four rods out. So if, you, if you've only got two guys, you need to get that, probably that fourth rod in first while one guy takes a fish. Okay, so one guy's got a fish on, the other guy's doing the thing and getting the rather lure in really quick. The trouble with using lures is baits aren't too bad, but lures tend to fight hard without a fish on it. So it takes a bit of time and effort to get in without getting it flying out of the water and hitting you in the face or something. So be cool about it. In the interim, the other two rods are screaming out. And if one has crossed over the other, that's when you'll lose a fish, unfortunately. It's just a part of the parcel. Um, if you had a left the other line out there, it may have got a fourth fish or it might have um, got caught up in the tangle anyhow. So it's just the way it is. Um, but there's been a lot of, uh, we've, I think every time we've been out, we've only had two single strikes. It's all been doubles or triples this year. So it's really good fun. And we will put that video out 
Um, I think Mustafa's working on it now, so next, uh, probably this weekend maybe. And you'll be able to watch what we went through last weekend out there. Um, but um, getting back to what we're saying about braid and mono, they both work well together. Um, so 15 kilo, just to let you know, there, there's a few brands on the market that are really thin, so the idea is to get your lure down deep or your baits down deeper. So not only lures but baits. So when we're trolling baits, we're using like a, um, a lead underneath the first hook or a, or a chin guard, whatever it might be, to try and get the bait down. We're trolling really slow, we've just got the boat in gear, or if you're paddling, you're just paddling really slow. And you might be doing like one, one knot or two knots maximum on jet ski, mate. You might have to try and slow down as much as you can, because I never like to go a bit faster. Um, but within the line, you get your baits down deeper or your lures down deeper in trolling. So um, the beauty of this line here, this, this Buku, this is um, Japanese uh, mono, and it will get down quite deep because 15 kilos is the same as any other brand, 10 kilo, and 24 is the same as any 15. So it allows you to get down uh, a, lot, a lot deeper, about one third the thickness of, um, compared to all less thickness. Sorry. Then in braids, same scenario. So Stewie's got here, um, some 60 pound kariki, or we might just cut a bit off. Pound, yeah, just cut a bit off at each. So um, 60 pound or kariki or any of that type of, say, around about 65, $75 braid is probably the biggest seller. Mm. Um, it is still quite Sorry. very thin compared to mono, but it's still thick. Um, and then obviously you jump up in quality and price to like a thinner braid, like a grappler or an osha braid. It's a lot tighter weave and it's a lot. Um, Thinner. But either of the braids, as because of the non-stretch aspect, your lures still work really hard and um, still very direct. Pass it around first. So this is 60 pound. Um, so you need the edge on everything you do when you're fishing, no matter whether it be mackerel, whiting, brim, snapper, it doesn't matter. Everything has a little secret and every little secret you can use is going to get you more fish, I promise you. Um, and it starts at your gear and then goes right through to how you do it. And times is the most important thing we'll talk about tonight. It's the right time of the day to go fishing. Uh, I'll do this one here too. So Zach, as Stuart said, um, it's all about getting your line down deeper. And at the moment, the fish are 20, about 20 metres down. One of our customers, um, mates, dropped, uh, jumped out of the side of the diamond reef the other day. I wouldn't do that to the sharks around, but he did. Um, he's a free diver guy. And he went down and it was, there's a thermocline of about 20 metres, it's quite dirty above that. Once you got down 20 metres, it was crystal clear and there was mackerel everywhere. They just didn't want to come above it. But they will come up and grab your bait, they will come up and grab your lure, because obviously it's, it's food to them. Um, but you need to get your, your baits or lures down as deep as you can. So the first one come around at 60 pound, the second one come around at 60 pound. And the edge in braid is getting the thinnest braid, but also you don't want Junk that's going to break real easy as well. It's got to be pound for pound, right? 60 60. So, um, price wise, these two braids are about very similar, but one's just hit the market. It's, it's made, actually, believe it or not, the company that makes this scrappler braid, which is around about, uh, I think you guys got 72 bucks or something like that, um, is the same company that makes that braid too. Okay, they make Daiwa, they make J braid, they make everything. They're the biggest makers in Japan, but they use a different quality braid. Um, Different fibre. Different fibre, different coatings, that's right. So in Japan, braid's not sold by the, uh, it's, it's sold by the, it's as a year braid. So some braid will last three years, has different coatings on it, some braid will last five years. Most braids will last two to three years, just to let you know that as well. So don't go changing your braid every year, you shouldn't have to. I'd like it if you did, but you don't have to. Um, it's three, five, I, some of my braids probably eight years old. Yeah. Um, but it's, it's getting a bit furry. A bit ratty. Yeah, ratty. <laughs> Yeah, uh, line lasts about two to three years as well, as long as it's not in the sun, okay? Okay, so we covered the braid. Leader, okay, so uh, when you're trawling baits and trawling uh, lures, with the mono, um, at the end of the mono, um, I'll still put probably around a, about, a, when I'm trawling, about 60 pound leader on, um, and I'll put a snap saw on the end of that, and how I join the mono to the leader, um, worst case scenario, I'll just do an all bright or something like that, quick and easy. Um, best case scenario would be I'd probably put a wind on leader on, so put a little plait and that, or a bimini twist and then run a, um, a wind on leader, which is about six metres long, 60, 80, 100 pounds, 100 max, and the snap saw, and those hooks straight onto your lure. Remember again, the, the heavier you go on your leader, the more drag it's going to pull that bait up or that lure up. 
so you want to use as light as possible. Um, a couple of years ago, the mackerel were a bit finicky there for a while, and I went down to, I think I was down to 25 pound fluorocarbon litre and taking a chance. Lost a few, but got lots of bites, where before I wasn't getting bites on 60. So, but now I'm using 60 is about as light as I'll go. Yeah, at the end of the day, yeah. mackerel is going to bite through 25, they're going to bite through 50, they're going to bite 100. through 100, 150, <laughs> they'll bite through it. Nothing will stop it. I had a gentleman, I don't know if he's here tonight, ask me about what's the best size line to go without getting bitten off, you can't, they'll bite through anything. 300, doesn't matter. Okay. Um, so that's your leaders. Um, wire selection. So. With wire, um, I think you've got a rig in your bags there, guys, which is a pilly rig we use. Oops, sorry. Thanks, mate. <laughs> sorry, mate. Thanks. Nice carpet, hey? <laughs> <laughs> sorry. Um, we've got um, a rig in there, which we use on pilchards or we use on little slimies, okay? Uh, or small gar. And that rig's rigged on single-strand wire. You have to learn, if you're going to make up um, your own rigs, and we actually suggest you make your own rigs, learn to make them. They're a pain in the backside for us to make. <laughs> Not saying that they are, though. They take time. So this rig, guys, um, will take, when you're learning, probably take you about 20 minutes to half yeah. hour. Yeah, like if you get pretty quick at it, pretty good, you can make it in under five minutes. Yeah, start off with, I think, 20 minutes. Yeah, yeah. 20, 25. You need, to learn, you need to learn to do the haywire twist, which is a twist on there, right, um, that you'll see that we use on the swivel and down the hook. And... Um, when you buy the wire, some of the wire actually shows you on the back of the packet how to do that twist. Uh, there's a little art to it, but once you get to use and know how to do it, it's quite easy, okay? Um, then the wire we use is generally no more than 38, uh, no less than 38 pounds and no more than about 69 when we're making up the, the pillar rig. This is the same pillar rig you see the guys trolling around on the end of their skis down at Palmy um, or anywhere. And I've been using this rig for, my dad taught me 40 years ago about the same sort of rig, but those days didn't have comb, we had copper, copper Telstra wire to wrap up the head of the pilchard. <laughs> but we'll put a pilly on when they defrost you a bit later and pass it around too, yeah. Um, but the hooks have got to be straight as well, so when you buy your hooks, make sure they're not offset. If they are, you'll need to put in a vise and straighten them up. They can't be twisted because that'll make your bait spin a bit, okay? It's all about keeping your bait straight and not spinning, and the bait will actually swim, okay? Because you try it really slow, and, uh, and the weight will make sure you make the head sit down and work it really well. The bigger rig we use is for gar and saris, which Stewie's got one here. Yeah, it's basically exactly the same, just a bigger hook. Bigger brother. And um, we just bend the hooks a little bit as well. It doesn't weaken them too much, um, just yep. so it sits a lot nicer in the bait. The lead's a bit heavier. A little bit heavier. And the wire's a bit heavier. Yeah. That's 69 or 88 pounds. So 58's as light as we use in that, and 105 is as heavy as we use on, on the bigger baits. We have um, we use different size hooks, so we might use up to this sort of size here, which is a, I think these are eights or nines, they're about six or sevens this trip. Yeah, they are, yeah. And um, as your baits get bigger, um, the hooks get bigger, they might go to four hooks, so you might use that on a big slimy or a gar or, or a, a small uh, tailor, 30, yeah. 35 centimetre tailor. Um, so, just so remember that. Yeah, <laughs> be careful what I say. Um, so the hooks are all all straight, there's no offset hooks here that we use. Um, you can buy hooks that are pre-done that are straight, okay? And you just gotta put the wire on away you go, and, and the sinker. Um, you'll notice down on that, on that rig at the bottom end of it where the um, bit of wire sticking up, what that does is that goes through the bottom of the fish's mouth and out through its nose, and that cone will go, go down, um, and that little wire sticking up through his head, his head's here, the wire sticking up and that cone goes down, it's got like a little end on it, and that goes between that, that little bit of wire sticking up and then you screw, uh, keep screwing up the screw on that um, spring on its head until it can't turn anymore, it's sort of locked in place. And then you pull the skirt down over the top and then just drop it in the water nice and neatly and it will swim beautifully, okay? At slow speed, not at six knots, but at one or two knots. <laughs> yeah. Like people think that the skirt is just for looks, it does mm. help. Mm. But um, it's to actually break up a lot of water as well. So it just kind of tapers water and directs it around the bait. 100% right. Whereas if you just run a nose cone on it, like there's a hole at the end of the nose cone, and um, it'll just fill your baits up with water and just blow them apart, blow them off the hooks. So Even at slow speed. Because water's quite warm, your baits are cooking while you troll. Mm. So they do get softer. They soften up. 
That's right. So, um, and this is called a, it's called a wog head. That's what the terminology is. Um, they're very popular in North Queensland. So it looks like that. It looks like you put it on a light shade or something. But it pulls back like that in the water. The head's there. Inside the head is a is a great big hole. Um, you can see that there. Big hole there. And in that hole, that cone goes up inside and guides it into there. As Stuart said before, same deal again. It's all locked in place. Um, there's no water can get on it and make it twist or whatever. It's all beautiful through the water and uh, it'll swim really well. Um, there's a lot of things we do though, like garfish. We, we pop the meat off the back to make it really swim well, which I'll show you in a moment when it defrosts. Um, saris, um, they're pretty straightforward. They're like a gar, but a little bit more uh, slimmer. They're like a Japanese pilchers, that's what they are. But we catch them out the front end as well. Um, the pilchards, um, we don't do much, but bonito and um, even slimies, sometimes you'll crack the tail without breaking the skin, so you break the bone just up where the tail sort of meets, like that at the back, and that'll make the tail swim as well. But you don't crack the skin. As Stuart said, when you pull through the water, they get a lot of, uh, like obviously, movement of water on them, and they can um, disintegrate pretty easy. And the other big thing too with trawling at the moment is a lot of weed out there, guys. So you need to be on the ball, checking your baits, checking your line, checking your lures all the time. Because you get a bit of weed on there, you could trawl for two hours and say, oh, I've got no bites, it was crap today. And then you wind in, you've got a big hunk of weed hanging off your bait, that's why. And you've got to go home, it's time to go to work. So check your baits every 15 minutes, check your lines, really important. Um, any questions so far on that at all? No, all good? Okay, there are other things you can use. Um, I use this for Wahoo too, but anything, those metal heads, if you've got that sort of thing, because they're heavy, okay? They'll help get your bait down deeper. So um, look at what you've got in your tackle box and try and make it work, okay? Oh, we've got it here. This is all you. In skirts, there's a trillion different colours. I, I think they nearly all do work, but pink is our biggest seller. Pink's our biggest seller, close to follow by white. Yeah, it's your last year. The, yeah. I think I told this question before, but last year we ran out of pink ones. We couldn't get pink ones. Um, as COVID comes in, there's a lot of things we can't get at times. So we've got to wait. We've got to, um, try something else. We had a heap of white skirts, we put the white ones on, the pink ones come back in stock, we sold all the white ones, a lot of the white ones, put all the pink ones back on again, no more white, and then we don't want a white because they've been catching fish on the white. We've never done white before. And uh, so now we do pink and white. And they actually bring out a... a, a like yeah, a, like a red head, like a quarter red, style. Yeah, pink and white, <laughs> red and white skirt. Be the best, best of both worlds. Um, but that's your sort of rig. So. We'll come back to uh, bring up the baits because we'll we've got to get the baits out, they're, just, they're not defrosted, so <laughs> we'll keep going along the track here. So you're getting to add to that at all that sort of thing? No, that's about it. Yeah, yeah, I think the biggest thing, as you said, Doug, mm. like there's a lot of water pressure on a bait. Try not to have a crappy oh. old slime that's been in the esky for three trips that has like holes in the skin and all that because they'll just fall straight off your hooks. Yep. yep. So you still better to do troll larvies than just dead baits? Yeah. I Got to come right up to that in one sec. <laughs> uh, but while we're on dead baits, um, this is called a, um, a chinga. Have you ever heard the terminology chinga? That's one there, right? We sell them downstairs. Um, there's two sizes. And how this works is um, don't use those little hooks. I don't know why it comes those little hooks, so it's ridiculous. But anyhow, get rid of those, put some of those big ones on. Um, you don't need the, the wire cone or anything on this, okay? So how this works is you line up so his mouth sits at the front of the V in there and then you just push that up underneath and out the top of his head because it's quite heavy wire. They come with these little tiny bands, little rubber bands here somewhere. <laughs> that seems to it, yep. And then the bands, um, the little tiny rubber bands, and you just hook it over, go under, then back over the top and hook it over the top of the pin again. And that holds him all in place in there. Plus you've already got the hooks up his guts, okay? We'll show you how to rig up, as I said, when we rig the baits up, we'll explain how to put the hooks in. Um, but these are really good because they're so heavy. That's four ounces or six ounces, I think it's quite heavy. So your bait is going to go vumbo down. How do we get baits down deeper? Um, there's three ways. One is, first way is using heavy weights on the head, okay? Second way is, um, if you haven't got heavy weights on the head, you come up about a metre and then run two swivels and put a barrel sinker in the front of that. So about a metre up from your bait or a metre and a half. You remember that's as far as you're going to be able to wind your line up to gaff the fish, you've got to remember that, okay, those big sinkers that are hanging around, swinging around, and uh, can maybe rip the hooks out of the fish. Um, so a metre's probably the safest length to do it at, because you can get right up to the fish there with the gaff. 
um, but you run one eight ounce barrel or two eight ounce barrels I'll run. Um, if I'm trolling, say my mate's got his downrigger, right? And how many people have downriggers on their boats? Anyone have downrigger? Some of you do. So downriggers are fantastic. Um, and you probably, if you're not using it, make sure you do, start using it. But, um, so this is my downrigger here, like that. And this is my rod sitting close to there, like that. And with a downrigger, you can um, you let out your line first, right? Sort of 40 metres back or 30 metres back with your bait swimming, or your bait attached or a live bait, whichever it may be. Not lures, I'm talking baits, okay? And then you just grab your line and you pull it into here. So this sort of goes, um, well, that's, yeah. yeah, I won't do that. <laughs> this comes into here and you put a rubber band on your line, which we can teach you anytime in the shop you how to do it. And then on the end of your downrigger here, you've got this big weight that's about five kilos or four kilos, okay? 10 pounds, 12 pounds. Um, and then um, it has a little thing on the end here. You can use a clip, like a release clip, which is like a set of car points sort of thing. Um, I prefer to use just a tether, like a uh, piece of cord, and I do a half hitch on the rubber band, okay? So then I've hitched on the rubber band here, and then all of a sudden my line goes, um, it's there, and it's hanging out still. But as soon as I drop this down, and say the bottom's down here, and the mackerel at, at, at 20 metres down, and say it's 30 metres deep or 35 metres deep, the mackerel at 20. So I'll drop this down to about 18 or 20 metres. Deep enough that I'd know it's going to get in the zone, but not deep enough it's going to get caught in the bottom. So that's how they work. And now, um, it's a slight angle to the back, so I'll lie there. It's about that sort of angle, I guess. Right, and then that's clipped onto my line here. So my rod now, you load your rod up, so the rod actually becomes, takes the weight of the downrigger ball, quite heavy, and um, so that's now down here. Not the full weight, it's never gonna hold the full weight, it's just yeah. gonna hold like some. Yeah, that's right. So that's got the weight of that. And that's 30 metres back, and here's my, my bait swimming around at the back here somewhere. Uh, my, my rig bait, sorry. And what happens is when that rod, uh, when you troll along, it's, the rod's bent like that. When you see the rod go up like that, so it's opposite to when you're fishing. When you're fishing, it bends over. When you're trolling down, it pops up. So when that pops up like that, uh, I've, I've got the fish on. Quickly wind up the sack line. Oops, there's a hook there. Wind up the sack line. And, um, and this, this pops off here because the rubber band breaks. And that's the slack you've got to take up because the fish is down out here somewhere. And, and you're on, that's how it works. But when you go back to those two eight ounce barrel sinkers I said before, if I've got my other rods out, one there and one here, say, um, if I'm using uh, just the weight of, say, that, or the, or the weight of the rig you guys have got, and this is the water, the water uh, top, that one doesn't work. Sorry. Get rid of that one. You've got dirty water. Yeah. Green water. <laughs> Green water. It's nice and clear down there. So my line um, with this one here, I'm going to obviously drop it back further because I want to try and get it down. But it might be maybe three metres under the surface. I'm doing one or two knots. It's, the angle's like nearly flat, right? When I put an eight ounce barrel on, it'll drop down to about that angle. It's quite deep. Okay, when I put two eight ounce barrels on, my downrigger before that one was down on that bad angle. With two eight ounce barrels, it's at about that angle. It's quite deep when you're going slow. And if you actually stop in corner, and you say you've got 40 metres out, it'll actually hit the bottom sometimes. It's right down there. So it's like a poor man's uh, downrigger, but it works so good. The only problem is you're fighting 16 ounces of weight of sinkers bouncing around on the rig, hence why you put two swivels and try and keep it all intact so it doesn't go down the line everywhere. And uh, maybe dislodge the bait out of the fish's mouth, or the hook, sorry. But just remember that. So let's say three metres, probably I'd say around 10, and this one here will get down around 15 to nearly 20, you know, the same as the downrigger. So when you're bait fishing, just have a couple of rods set up with different weights on them. And whichever one's getting the hits, so you have to quickly cut off and retie in that same scenario, because that's the where they're feeding. Okay? That, that Jim gave on 
Mm. Oh, I have at times, yes, I have. It depends on if they're going to come up and eat that. Um, and for some reason at the moment, they're not going much above... They're coming up to the top, they're still hitting lures and stuff, but um, they're, if, you, if you're in the zone in that, in that sort of down this area, you get a lot more fish. Yeah, same with the divers at the moment. There's certain divers in lures we've been using that we know get down sort of 15 metres. And for them, it's, they can see it it's right above their heads, they'll come and grab it. But if you're only getting down three or four metres, you're not getting as many hits. So the little lures this year aren't doing this because it's a bigger deep diving lures. Okay. Does that all make sense? Yep, cool. Um, what else are we going to talk about there, Stewie, on the boats? Um, I'll just touch on this real quickly. With everything, there's been a shortage of absolutely everything. Um, just if you've got any chin guards at home or anything, see how the hooks sit that way. So oh, yeah. they've actually put an iron wrong. So if you buy it here, we'll do it for you. But um, you just need another split ring on it, just so the hooks always sit upward. Like, so they actually sit along the gut of the fish and up. Um, you don't want to put the hooks in the side of your pilly or your gar mm. or anything, because that will create a spin, because it's more weighted on one side. So are you yeah. putting the hooks in and, and um, not exposing the, the hook no. at all? No, the tips, no, it's generally... The tips might just be through. Yeah, on, on some of the base, so, but generally not. No, they're, they're right. embedded inside, but they'll, yeah. they'll just crunch it so hard yeah, and pull. Yeah. As soon as, because the momentum's forward and they're pulling back, it's going to, um, they're going to get hooked up. Yeah, the beauty about bait fishing is you rarely lose a fish when they hit it, you're hooked. Yeah, and it's generally down further than a, than a, a, a hard body's sort of in the mouth somewhere, you know? Yeah. Um, I think that's about probably it on, the, on that side of things. Yeah. Let's go to the live bait now. So, so live bait rigs. Um, so with live bait rigs, um, we, you have to have certain type of live bait rigs made up, which is generally a single hook at the front. Small trace, this is one we make in the shop here. Short trace, that's a little bit, maybe too short maybe at the moment, but not too bad. For spotties, it's Very good. Very small bait. Very small bait, but for little yakkers, that's perfect. I'll pass this around. Um, so what happens is um, that hook there will go in here and out, or through his nose and out. And this one here will, will just dig into the side of him. It won't go right through. It'll just go through the side, not even to his spine, and, uh, and just stick out, or it'll go in his belly, and just two will sit out either side of him at the back. Does that make sense? We'll pass one around when we get these baits defrosted. <laughs> Pretend it's a live bait. Um, and then as you get bigger, say your baits get bigger and you're using like, um, uh, like a, a decent sized slimy or something like that, your rig gets a little bit bigger again. So a little bit more at the front. I'm um, using single strand wire. That one's actually snelled on. That's uh, 40 pound, is it? Yeah, it's about 40 pound nylon yep. coated. Yep. So multi-strand under it and it's nylon coated over the top. So you can snell hooks on. I think I've showed people last year how we snell on our little uh, float line hook, which we'll talk about a bit later. Um, but you can snell wire as well. So it allows you to use two hooks instead of crimping off another one or tying another one off. This one's actually tied off on, on the eye twice. So one's the trace and one's the, um, sorry, that's the trace there, <laughs> and one's the treble. Um, why do you use a treble instead of a single hook at the back? The hookup rate is by far better. It's so much better. So you need to learn to use trebles instead of two lots of single hooks. Um, I know for jewies, everything else that we use two single hooks for live bait for kings, whatever. But for mackerel, a treble's better. Okay. Some guys will run three trebles. So they'll run one underneath. This is on dead baits or live baits. One underneath, one on the side, one on, at the back, one at the top, like all over the joint and still the, the guide at the front. Because you're going so slow, he'll still swim along, he'll be in pain obviously, but he'll still swim along and do his thing. Um, and one thing about live baits is they will come, I don't know, they sense it, but they'll come right up to the top to get the live bait. That doesn't have to be so much in the zone. It does help, but if it's not, they'll come right up to it. Bigger version, we'll pass it around, Stuart. Uh, do you want to pass it around? Oh, uh, debate? Yeah, if you want we'll to. Keep, we'll keep that one and we'll pass it around. Okay, yeah, cool. Okay. Yeah. Um, the other thing is, yeah, as Doug said, don't put the um, stinger hook through to the spine or anything. You just want it just in. Because mm. you don't want to keep bait. it alive. Yeah. Yeah. You're running any sort of weight on a live bait? Um, so we're using those off a downrigger as well, yeah. and the same system with the two big barrel big weights, big, big barrel singers. Just swimming in slowly. Yeah. 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 Just in gear. Just in gear, yeah. So trebles, um, I wouldn't use much smaller than about a size two, okay? And use a sharp one, use one that's about triple strength. 
So very sharp, very strong. Um, up to about a 1.0 maybe if I'm using a decent tail or a big slimy or whatever it might be. Okay. Um, just in getting back to the bait jig scenario because we're talking about live baits here at the moment. Um, how many people use the one that's like a, that sort of rainbow type film? I'll pass this around. Like a fish um, skin I, I believe that's the most productive type of bait jig rather than use the white skin. The white skin will work. I find the water's dirty. That's we got white skin there because I know the water's going to be dirty. <laughs> so you got a white skin. You got one of those. So try the difference when you're out there next time you're out there in your bag, and see how you go with them. Okay. Um, in bait jigs, there's like seriously, guys. There's so many different bait jigs. Um, there's like the feather ones. Sometimes I smack them on these because these actually have a bit of weight on them. They're actually weighted on the head. So when you do the jerk, it actually is really aggressive on the, on the little piece hanging off the side because it has weight on it. So it's not like loose in the water. It's very aggressive because it pulls down and, and darts out of the joint and it really pees them off and they just smack it, especially slimies. So I'll pass that one around too, Stu. Um, the springs and everything else that you'd need, um, you can buy those as well. You can buy all the bits and pieces. To give you some idea, the rig that's in your bag now, we sell for about 25 bucks or something. It takes us about, uh, our good staff, about five to 10 minutes to make one. <laughs> bad staff, about 20 minutes. <laughs> We've got no bad staff, they're all good staff, but the slow ones, the learners. Um, you've got to try to be, you've got to be politically correct here. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the learners. Sorry, Stuart. That's me. I'm in that category, okay? Yeah. And then, um, um, but you could um, probably make this, the reason why it's cost so much is because the, the labour intense. Uh, so, you could probably make it for about, um, I'd say five bucks. It's just your time. So learn to make them yourself. And make up pre-mackerel season, say November, December, a few beers, and make up 10 rigs and you're ready to roll for the season, you know? Okay. It's always yeah. easier to make it before the season starts because all the stuff's readily available. There's always a stock shortage this mm. time of year. It's so hard to get wire. And exactly yeah. right. And do it before you get this to the third beer. Exactly right. Yeah. yeah. The worst case scenario is when you're doing that haywire twist, I've done, I've done it so many times, the wire will go and it sticks outside your finger somewhere. It's, it's, it's very sharp. aggressive and sharp. <laughs> so be careful with the wire. Um, okay, bait jigs, this one on the bait jig. We talk, told you how to do it, I hope you try it guys, okay. Um, this little tool here is a little Sabiki bait jig de-hooker. So has anyone used the de-hooker on the reef style where you just flip the fish into the basket? It's a baby version of it. So good. So when you've got this string of fish, right, you just hold the weight at the top, hook this onto the first fish above the bait well and just go like that and it just flips straight into the well without touching it. If you touch it, you're going to take the slime off and you're going to destroy it, like it'll die quicker. It won't die straight away, but it'll die quicker. Yeah. Second thing is you're going to get your hand spiked to the crap of it, trying to do it. Generally falls on the floor, you have trouble trying to pick it up, you hit your head on something while the wave goes like that, trying to get it off the floor. It all happens. Um, these things make life easier, about five bucks. Pass that around too, thanks Stuart. Um, okay, that's probably about it. Okay, now I'm gonna tell you how to do it with the, with the baits, how we do it, anyhow, Stuart and I do it. So, um, we'll get it rigged up in a moment, but we'll just uh, grab one of these pens. So, really important to understand your GPS, understand where the fish are. So, if I'm gonna get, um, bait fishing, I still take my hard bodies and I'll troll the first 10 or 15 minutes with hard bodies. And I'll try and work out where the fish are. They move around a little bit, but they're generally on the pinnacles, always on the pinnacles, uh, or on bait, if the bait's sitting off the pinnacles. Um, and with, uh, with mackerel, I'll just do that, say so this is your, uh, can you all see that from the back okay? A bit hard maybe, a black one. Uh, you keep losing them, Stu. Yeah. <laughs> that blue one works, you reckon? Uh, yeah, Trying to find one a bit darker. There you go. Oh, cheers, mate. Thank you, sir. Darling. So, so that's your um, plotter and that's your sounder, okay? So, I've got a couple of marks on my, on my screen where they normally are. Might be number 13, number 11's over here. And I've got a couple of little fish symbols, maybe here, here, and maybe one over here. And I know this spot here and this spot here really work well, and they're maybe 400 metres apart or 500 metres apart from there to there. 
And that one there is maybe 150 or 200 metres that way, and a couple in between. So what I'll do is I'll throw my at least two or three hard bodies out. I'll be sitting on about six knots. And I'm coming down, this is, this is um, south here, this is north, and I'm heading from the seaway to here. When I get to about probably around here somewhere, 100 metres before it, I'll put the lures out, make sure my baits are out and defrosting. <laughs> I always forget to do that. And then I, when I get to about, uh, I'll head straight for that zone there, right? Um, when I get there, I'll look at the screen, hope for the screen, that, that area there is like this little pinnacle here coming up. If there's bait on there, that's all good, but you want to try and see this sort of thing, which is like lines. And that's how mackerel look when they're stacked up. They're rarely that way. They're not like um, so much like this or the thing. They're always vertically. That's just the way they sit in the school. Have you ever noticed? Anyone seen that before out there with the mackerel? You should have, hopefully. If you haven't, try and dial your sounder in a bit better. Um, and then I'll go over to here and I'll come up that little pinnacle here. There's a bit of bait there, but there's nothing there. And then I'll just keep trolling my hard bodies. Hopefully I've got a strike in this zone too, by the way, on the way through. Um, I'll get to around here somewhere, which is this little pinnacle here. Um, there might be a couple of fish there, so I know they're there. And I'll come up to my, one of my favorite honey holes here, this big guy here, and they're stacked up above it again. So, and then I might go do my lap around here, and I'll come back to here, obviously. At this one here, uh, there's not much there, a bit of bait. So what I'll do, I'll just do one more lap around. Hopefully, if I've got a hit, I'll keep trolling the hard bodies, by the way, <laughs> until they don't go. But if I give it two laps, I haven't got a fish, then I'll drop it, I'll stick to live bait, uh, to my baits, or I'll get live baits and drop the live baits out. But I'll be concentrating, knowing that and that one route and that one there. So I'll probably skip that one, and my next um, lap will be in this sort of progression. I probably won't worry about that one there, and I'll just come back up and just maybe look for some new ground on the way around, and then just keep doing like that sort of lap around, okay? And that's how I'll do it for about one or two hours. If there's nothing happening by that time, um, and they're not taking the baits, and, I, and I've got a hit on a hard body earlier, I might switch back to hard bodies, okay? But if there's a bite time, which is what I spoke about earlier, um, I'll definitely have either the baits or the lures of, of constant I'm going to use um, will be at that time is, is worth waiting for. So what I mean by that is um, if you got high tide at say 6am, okay, high tide, um, I, I don't know about Stuart, but I think Stuart works similar to me. Yeah. <laughs> There's always a bite time, it doesn't matter if you're flatty fishing or mackerel fishing or snap or whatever, it's always about two hours after, so it'll start about You'll get a high tide bite time, you always get a bite time on the tide, but then you'll always get one about two hours later, two and a half hours later, so around eight, and it'll go for about two hours to about 10. So that bite period there will be better than that or better than the low tide one. And that's called the major bite time of the day. And it's always two hours or two and a half hours after high tide. Okay, and it coincides sometimes with moon rising or moon setting, but generally moon rising actually. And, um, and it's and for some reason, it's always around that period after high tide. It's never after low tide, it's always high tide. So have you got, anyone never worked on that before? Please try it. Everything, doesn't matter if it's prawns, crabs, fish, <laughs> squid. <laughs> it's just, that's it. <laughs> um, no, it doesn't at all. So, oh, you will, so you get three bite times, you get Obviously sunrise, sunset, that's two bite times actually, you get four. Then you'll get your tide bite times, which is the high tide and the low tide. There's always a minor bite period, they call it the minor bite period. And the major bite period is always that period after high tide. And if you can get that, if that was at 4 a.m. and that was at six till eight, that's the hottest, that's, what, that's when you get like the three fish stacked up on the bite charts. Because um, you know it's the right time in the morning, as we are saying. Um, and it's also the perfect time to um, um, get that period of, of bite time. The problem we have at this time of the year is um, if you do get that period, which is coming up next week, um, and next week there's a big swell forecast from that big low that's over near Solomon's or somewhere, I don't know, near Vanuatu at the moment, that's building, 
um, I have a look at the, uh, the charts next week. The wind drops off sort of Wednesday, uh, but the swell picks up the 2.4 to 4 metres on the sets. And that's always, when you finish that period, it's getting towards the bottom of the tide. And it's, when you come in, it's a bit ugly. And if the wind comes up, it's even more ugly. So it's, you got to be careful if you want to try and get that bite period. But when you, get, when you have a lot of luck with the bite period, it's very um, addictive. And you sort of take the punt on the seaway. Because <laughs> you know it's going to happen. Like we went out, I went out with a friend of mine on uh, Jason on Thursday. We went Friday, we went, yeah, yeah, Thursday. Thursday morning. And um, the bite period wasn't until sort of midday. And um, we went out in the morning and we got. Uh, lost three. Yeah, lost three, I think. Yeah, a bit not fine and lost two others. And we only fished, because we've been working at 8 o'clock, so we only fished for an hour, 58 minutes or something. It was a very quick fish. Um, but we knew the bike period was coming up just before lunch. So went to work and then I, I snuck out of here for just two hours and he picked me up at the boat ramp, at the at marina, sorry. It went a bit like this. Oh, I'm just, did, just nipping out shoot, just sort of dropped something off and like five hours later we're like, where is he? And yeah. Yeah, long two hours. Yeah, yeah. So anyway, he picked me up at, at 12, I was running a bit late. Picked me up at 12, he was already waiting. And we were back in by two, um, but then I get all my dad to clean the fish or whatever. Um, so um, that period between 12 and 2, we got, um, we, in between wine and fishing, we hooked up seven fish, or eight fish, seven definitely. We had um, a single hit, a double hit, I think, and maybe two triples, one of the eight hits, I don't know what it was. Um, it was just off the Richter scale. And it was in the middle of the day, like one o'clock in the afternoon. But it was on that perfect bite time period. And that's how addictive it is, because you just know it's going to work. And it doesn't matter if I'm out pearl perch fishing on the bottom out there, uh, you know, 50 k's out, and it says two o'clock in the afternoon. We're not getting anything all morning, so just nothing. We'll wait, and we just know only a bag out within, you know, two drifts, because that's when the bite period is. So please understand in in all all your fishing, the bite period. Understand that. Saloon charts are pretty close to it actually. Very close. And yeah. windy's not too bad as well. Yeah. So that's going to be my scenario. Does that all make sense? Okay. Um, but you need to mark new ground. So um, this year, for those of you who've been down to the Diamond Reef or Southport, which seems to be the honey hole at the moment, um, on any given day during the week, last week, there were 60 boats there. I don't know where those guys don't work or whatever, but there was a lot of boats. They've all got three guys in each boat. There's 200 guys that aren't working. Um, maybe some retired. I don't know. Good on them. Uh, and then... On Saturday, I didn't go out, but I heard there was like 120 yeah, boats there. Ridiculous. Did anyone go out Saturday? Yeah. You went out, mate? Yeah. yeah. Off the Richter scale. You people... Troll that, mate. You yeah. Troll that. So, I'm going to talk about trolling. When we go hard bodies, it's really hard to troll hard bodies with a lot of boats. Um, but you need to um, be politically correct in your driving skills <laughs> and lots of other things. And when you're using baits, because your lines aren't down so deep, they're a long way out to try and get them down deep. So. When you get a lot of boats around, it's really hard to trawl um, three or four rods out, knowing there's 60 metres behind the boat, and there's a guy coming straight across your backside, and if you speed up, you're going to rip the base off the, off the hooks. So it's a really, like, what do you do? You know, the best thing to actually do is actually just stop and let your bait sink, because you can't beat him. If he's trawling lures fast and you're trawling slow, he's going to run over your lines. Okay, so just stop, and then he'll normally move away a bit if you stop as well and let your line sink down. So that's one comment I can give you. How to do it. Because <laughs> there's... There, theoretically, you should keep going like that around your, around your things, but some people m must have their marks that way. So they'll go that way while the other boats are going this way. And it gets pretty busy and, and a bit um, daunting at times. And you just got to put up with it. And that's the way it is. And we're all learning. Um, so that's about it for bait fishing. Any questions at all on bait? Okay, everyone's good. So you got your gear, you got your live bait, you got your dead baits, yes mate. So you're always trolling with your with your baits. <sighs> you are. Um, in that aspect, I'm gonna quickly go to float lining next and and, and anchor at anchor and stuff like that next. Yeah, but but with this scenario, yeah, we're trolling mate, hundred percent. One to two knots, no faster. The slower as your boat could do. If you've got two motors, turn one off. I'll just leave it neutral and troll with one motor. You need to try and keep the speed down as low as you can. Okay. 
Um, so you add to that, buddy, as well? No, that's about it. I think yeah, I've yeah, yeah. yeah, okay. Yeah. So the next case scenario is, um, as I said earlier, um, I've marked, got that mark I like to go to. It's got the big pinnacle. And um, the pinnacle say, down here on the bottom. And the bait's here. And I've got mackerel on my sound like this. And a couple more over here. I'm going to try and put my boat, the tide's going this way. So I'm going to try and put my boat around about here somewhere at anchor. Guys do drift with live baits out there. And I think it was last Thursday when I was out there. Um, there's, or, or even Friday, I think there's a few guys hooking yeah, up on live baits, just drifting live baits at the back. Um, some guys had balloons on them, some guys had them down deeper. But just drifting with live baits, mate, and did well. Um, and this is the surface here. So, and I've got my rods out everywhere. I'll put out four or five rods, obviously two of us in the boat, can about three per person, um, in, in that scenario. Um, and I'll have one right down here with a light bait on it, okay? So it's down deep. Um, I generally run a live bait, I run my sinker right on top of, the, of his head, just to hold him in position sort of thing. If it's a decent sized uh, tailor or slimy or whatever it might be, um, he'll actually swim up, up from that sinker and the sinker will fall down this way. Then he'll sort of get tired and pull back down again. Okay. Um, then my next one, I'm gonna put maybe another livey out halfway down in this area here. Um, I wouldn't, I don't normally put them out the back on a balloon, some guys do, but it's just too dangerous if all the guys are zooming around if you're looking for trouble. So keep them down fairly deep. Um, and then I'll have this one here, we'll have a pilly out with just a small ball sinker, that's about as far as I'll go, with just a gang hook on it. I like to use small gangs on, for mackerel, like about three two o's, because the hook's really hidden in the bait. I use fairly big pillies, little hooks. I know it doesn't sound ethical or right, but it works. <laughs> if I use big hooks and little pillies, I don't get as many bites, it becomes too visible, the hooks sometimes fall out of the pilly. Um, but if you go the other way, it works really well. So I've got a pilly out here, um, and I might put two of those out. I might put one down just a little bit deeper here, out the back, with a pilly on it and a, and a ball sinker straight onto it. Um, I don't use wire on those. I take the punt. I do get bitten off sometimes, but I get the gang hook is about probably, I say about 60% return rate of getting a fish on it. Where if you use a single hook, it's an instant bite off on, on mono. A gang hook's not too bad. So, Little gang hooks, three two O's or three three O's, three four O's max. Even if I had a pilch like this big one here, um, I'd only have maybe three four O's in it, which is only going to probably go to about here on the pilly. Um, but that's how I want to do it. Um, and then I'll get my son, if he's with me, so that's four rods out. He'll be up the front here and he'll be just spinning, throwing the lure out everywhere, spinning. And I'll be down the back and I'll be, and I've got a burly trial going at the same time down here, right? Lots of burly, chopped up pillies, heaps of chopped up pillies. And um, this is when you get the yellow fin, so around April, May, you get a little yellow fin up to about eight kilos, four to five kilos sort of average. And you'll see them zipping around. You'll see them actually shoot out from under the boat and once you throw a bit of burly out, they're hiding under the boat, I think, and they'll just shoot out. It happens many times. And um, they'll, just, they'll smack this, or you might just um, throw a metal out and start spinning, I hit that straight away. So I'm spinning in this burly trial with my lures here. And my son sees me, he'll fish, he'll be straight down there as well. But these lines here are more at the side, maybe if there's a bit of current, they, they may be at the back, but I'm trying to keep the back clean and the front clean so we can both spin lures, okay? So if you do that scenario, um, you'll get definitely a lot of fish. And we bake out all the time, like on the Spanish, at, at anchor um, in that time of the year. So remember from, I trolled to about probably April at the latest, or late March, so another six weeks, and then I'll switch to doing that. Okay. Doug, are you using a, um, a reef anchor? Uh, that's a good question too. Whatever anchor's on my boat. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'm a bit rough. Um, no, I generally use a plough style actually. Yeah, yeah plough style. Uh, chain on it, yes, yeah. lots of chain actually, yeah. yeah. And um, it tends to sort of pull up pretty good. If the wind starts to blow, like say you've got a northerly comes in at 15 knots, it can get a bit stuck sometimes. Um, but on my tinny, it's only four and a half, five minute tinny, um, I used to use um, those anchors that fold out. Yeah. 
and reverse chain at the front yeah. with, with a, um, a uh, zip tie, a couple two zip ties at the back, and then pull it that way and just snaps off and yeah. it comes straight up. Right yeah, it's really easy. Um, but with the boat I got now, um, it's just a plow anchor on an electric winch. Just drop it down and try and get it off. Has anyone got the anchor stuck and couldn't get it off? Have you tried, has anyone had that scenario? You probably have, and if you haven't, you will get it one day. So there's an art to doing that too. Do you want me to quickly show you? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, I got sidetracked. Um, it's quite dangerous, and I've been in with many customers and many friends. And we've nearly gone over so many times, especially out wider when the current's raging. And even in six, seven metre plate boats, doesn't matter. But um, if this is your boat here, Oh, sorry, just make sure it doesn't look like it's going to go under you. Straight. And my anchor's down here on the bottom. There's a bit of reef here. And it's stuck in here sort of thing. Um, and I'm having trouble trying to get it off. So what I'll do, looking down on top now, if that's my boat there and my anchor's, my line's out there, um, and I'll try to get it off, I just can't get it off. It's just the boat, you pull it as tight as you can, it's just stuck. So what you do is um, you just let out as much rope as you can, maybe another 20 or 30 metres of rope, enough that allows you to drive off with a bit of slack behind you. And then your rope needs to be tight. to get a good strong bollard on the front here and tie it on pretty tight. And what you do is you actually head, so that your boat now is sitting back here, okay, and the rope's down there like that, right? So I'm gonna drive around this way that rope will come down um, beside, beside me driving there, and I can see where it is beside the boat. You don't want to run over it. It's really important not to run over it, of course. Um, and then you just do a big circle around like that, and you know where you were, and make sure you mark on the screen where, you originally, where your anchor originally was, okay? A big circle around. When you get to about here, or actually about here, if the boat's starting to really pull down like that, you need to come back with it, but not, not too sharp. That's when you can flip a boat over. So it's quite scary when you get the rank is stuck sometimes. Uh, and you come back around and you just do that big loop again. And generally you'll pop it at somewhere in this area here. It'll pop off and you'll be like that and the boat's getting pulled a bit like this. You'll feel it go yeah, like that. You'll feel it come off. Pop off. And that's uh, that you turn the boat straight into uh, straight that way into this uh, rope that's in front of the boat here and quickly just pull it in as much as you can so it doesn't hit the bottom again. Okay. It doesn't matter if you've got a four metre tinny or an eight metre boat, it's all the same scenario. Um, if you've got an electric winch, um, you've got to be careful because you can snap your on the front of your boat where you've got the bow sprit sort of on the front of your boat like that with the roller on it. Um, you can snap that off, and I snapped one off once, it was really scary actually. So <laughs> we were doing that scenario, and, um, and I had a couple of mates with me, and um, we were all watching the anchor, I was down the side watching the anchor, and next minute, and there's a bow rail on the front of the boat that went down here like this, so it was actually a gap there, and, they had, and it was tied onto the bollard here, so the rope's here, out through the roller and out. And um, just the pressure, and 23 foot boat, and that snapped off here and went thump it's off their heads. Like it was, I don't know how close it came to their heads, but I was very close. And I felt very sick. <laughs> and we just cut it off and left it. <laughs> it was too hard. But you've got to be really careful. Know, know your boat. I didn't know the boat at that time, obviously. And know when that point of it's going to maybe. The spring, because you get stretchy the rope, right? If you get too much stretch and it doesn't go any more, it's going to pop you back real quick. And don't ever, the most important thing is ever, um, if you're in this scenario sitting here like this, like that, with your anchor like that, and you think, I'll pull it from the back, all right? And if you um, get some loose rope and you tie it on here, all right? Because you think, I can pull it from the back better, but the currents, um, Ripping this way, right? Okay. Say if you're out, out in the deep water, so this is a, a safety thing. You must um, never do that for a start because it doesn't work at the front's best. And um, the second thing is, if you do do that, 
I've seen guys, and it happened to us too with the mate I was with, um, untie the front there before you start the motor. Don't ever do that. Your motor has to be started up first. And, uh, or if it conks out, you know, up deep shit. So that, if you've undone that and, this, um, and, you, and your boat's tied on here and your motor conks out, what happens straight away is the boat turns around this way into the current and that pulls the, the disc goes under. You get fill up, put it in. If you go to self draining, it goes straight down. Or yeah, any boat, it just goes straight down. So it happens so quick, it just shifts around and the back corner starts to go down under water. So be really careful with that one. So I suggest don't tighten the back, take the chance at the front. Okay. What about spot lock? Yeah, okay, spot lock, yeah, much safer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, oh, uh, look, it, it pushes the burl out the back of the boat because so, it's always been pushing like that. Um, but mate, at the end of the day, um, it's probably the easiest way to manoeuvre maneuver around if you want to quickly just try the next pinnacle. You have to pull the anchor up and go through that ring roll. Um, the problem is uh, a lot of people don't like it because they get jealous, I guess. I don't know. Yeah. At the if end you of spotlight, it's like spotlock on a fad. People don't like it, you know. But it works really well. Yeah. Unless it's really uh, strong, like wind against current. Yeah. We had the other, we had the other day, and there was this boat there, wasn't this true? And he was struggling, like he had a fairly big boat. It wasn't yeah. really rough, but his motor was flexing yeah. so much. We we're waiting for it to like a lot of, snap. Yeah. Yeah, so. Oh, no, it's not at all. No, 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 not at all. No, it's, it's all in favour. So if you've got an electric outboard, use it. Yep. Spot lock's really good. So, just one quick question before yep. we were dropping the lab base down. What mm. kind of rig do you use to actually drop the lab base down? So, I'm running the sinker right on top of um, just a bit of leader, like 30 or 40 pound fluorocarbon. Fluoro. Yep, definitely fluoro. And then so the gang hook. <laughs> oh, it's good. The gang hooks, um, you won't get bitten off. Um, with the live bait, uh, you run a really short leader, like we showed that one going, did it go around before? I think? Yeah, that's one. Yeah, the one short one leader. One, yeah. yeah, so that's for your live baits, mate. So only pilchers I use the gang hook on, um, and when I'm float lining for, for um, uh, which I'll talk about next, for spotties, um, I'm using a, a short, small bit of wire, like so, with a half, put a, half a pillar. Just put the sinker straight on top of that. Right? Uh, I try not to use anything actually when I'm flat line for spotties, but sometimes you need to because there's a bit of the current or whatever. I might use it like a zero ball or a one ball that's sitting above the swivel sinker, above the swivel here. Yeah. And uh, I'll show you a little picture of them. I think they're getting softer now. Is that ready? Yeah. Uh, okay, so we'll keep, keep going. So, any questions on the live bait anchor? Everyone's good? Okay, so float lining. So float lining is really good fun, and we're using light gear like Stewie showed you first up there. Um, having an absolute ball, the reels are screaming. Uh, I'm only using like 15, 20 pound braid, 30 max. Uh, pretty light stuff. Uh, bait runners are really good if you've got bait runners. Uh, 4,000 through to about 8,000 size, or the old 4,500 size, whatever you got. Um, we're using a rig like this, and as the gentleman just said, to use sinker or not sinker. Um, I prefer not to use no float, no sinker, I just have it free running. Okay. But if there's current, I'll cast it up current and let it come down and I'll leave the reel in free spool as well. Um, with using the overheads, it's hard to cast an overhead with an unweighted pilchard on it. Right? You can't really do it very well. It's a little bait cast you can, but if you've got like a, I don't know, like a TLD, a TLD 10 yeah. or 15, well, sorry, 15 these days, <laughs> um, some age, um, it's hard to cast. So you'll see guys in boats down at Palmy and Mermaid They'll put the bait in the water and they'll just strip it off by hand and just let it run out. And that's all you can do. You can't really do much else. So that's why I like to use egg beers. And I leave the bale arm open and I cast it up and I just see it flick out like the snapper fish is flicking out 100 miles an hour. You know they've hit it on the pole. Um, otherwise, it gets to the right zone. I just click it into gear. I undo the, dra uh, the drag off every time. And when the fish hits, I then do it back up again. Okay, you can get little clips that you can clip your line into. Um, that sits on the rod and it just and have your drag preset and it just um, flicks out off that a bit of drop back or you can have a drag set or whatever you want. Um, but I just have it drag set reasonably loose mm. and they just scream off. Uh, but you need to know the same scenario before you need to know the fish are on the are stacked up there and you anchor up 
and watch when you go around, say, the, say we go to Mermaid Beach Reef, it's catching spotties, right? Again, I get there, I throw my lures out. <laughs> my lures always go straight out as soon as I arrive anywhere. And I'll just do a, a lap around the whole field. Or I might put a couple of pillies out on those rigs and do a slow troll around. And I'm watching everyone I'm seeing, okay? And I'm marking fish as well. So I see fish on the sounder at that part of the reef. So there's 50 boats there. I obviously don't go through the middle and I go around them. And um, I've got a few spots already that I know will work, but if I'm going around and all of a sudden I see fish there and he's getting a fish or those few boats there are getting them, I'm probably going to come back to that spot and I'll go do a lap right around and if there's not much happening at all in that 20 minutes it's taking me to go right around the whole pack, I'll then um, probably go to my spots and just wait or wait for that um, bite time period and they'll come on. If um, uh, everyone's catching them because mackerel do move around so they're not necessarily going to stay in that one area, especially that palm and mermaid. They do big, um, big circles around. That's why you hear people's ratchets going here and then here and then here eventually it gets to you. They just keep doing a big circle around everyone. It takes maybe half an hour or 20 minutes for them before they come back again. And that's just how it works. So if you, anyone experienced that down there yet? I'm sure you would have, I think, because that's how it normally works. Um, one other thing I found at Mermaid too, when I'm trolling those pillies on those rigs, which are extremely good, if you've got too, not too many boats, drop them right out. I'm talking like 80 to 100 metres back. Right, right out. You don't need to add any weight to them because down there's only what is it, 16 metres deep or something. It's quite shallow, 18 metres deep. Um, your line's getting down probably two or three metres. When I see those fish stacked up and I know my line's 100 metres back, just after I get over them, I'll pull the back to neutral, my motor, um, and jet ski, just back in neutral mate and let those baits sink down right in the marks because you're, you're as your momentum's going forward um, so I do this as soon as I go to those fish I just pull back to neutral so my momentum's going forward my baits are going down by the time I sort of estimate where the fish were my baits are hopefully in the zone um, you don't want to hit the bottom though and then as soon as I click it in the gear and they come back up it just they're on this is how it happens and when you're turning is when you get a lot of hits too because either fish is following your bait or when you turn, the, the, the bait drops down quite deep and then it gets slingshotted back up. When it gets slingshotted back up, that's when they'll nail it because it's like the fish is trying to escape or whatever it might be and they just get the, the predator will eat it. And simple as that. So you get a lot of fish on, on the turns as you're turning. Okay. Little hints. Um, but when I'm float lining, so I'm down there on float lining, same scenario, I'm, I'm building up heaps, I'm at anchor, um, I've got all my, all my lines out. If there's a bit of current, maybe I'll put a little sinker on. If there's no current, I just, um, sometimes no current's a problem because you keep getting down to the bottom and that's when you may have to use a float system. Um, please don't use the styrene. I hate seeing a million pieces of styrene floating on the <laughs> surface. So what we use is um, the same system we use for catching gar and every other little fish, at least bigger fish. Um, we use a float like so, just a little, a little um, that type of float with a hole through the centre. Um, we put a on the line, we put a float stopper bead, got them downstairs, show you how it works. Uh, the line goes through the centre here, and then you tie on that little wire rig, sort of like that, and then your wire, and then your, your hook, and that's uh, embedded into the pilchard, sort of thing. Cut off there, use half pilchard, not full ones. You can put gangs on if you want, but I don't. Let me put that here. Um, and that, there you just set it at different depths. So what happens is that little rubber stopper can slide up your line, it can go into your reel and you can cast it out, it doesn't get caught up at all. It's only a little tiny little silicon rubber. And the weight of the pilchard pulls the line through. So um, if I've set that at three metres, well that'll be down, down here three metres down. The pilchard's down there, my line's up here, and my stopper beads on top of the little, the little float. So you don't actually visually see the float that much. You'll hear the fish take off, so don't worry about looking at your floats. That's only when you're gar fishing, you look at floats. <laughs> but with mackerel, you just hear the screaming sound when they take off. But it's just to hold the bait from hitting the bottom, otherwise those little red rock cods and all the shit have you. Okay, the little, little ones that everyone catches. So that's cheap, very cheap system to use and it's very, very good. Okay, so when you cast it out, that sitting um, where that rig is, Stewie here somewhere, mate. Disappeared. <laughs> yes. Anyhow, oh, that's it. So it's true.
camouflage. Fish probably didn't see that. Um, so the float's sitting right above here when you cast it out, so it's really easy to cast out. You just hoik it out, on, on an egg beater that is. And then uh, it hits the water, the float stays on top of the water, this just falls down from momentum on the way to the pilchard. You can put a little sink on there if you wanted to. And then the stopper bead comes down and hits the float and this is down, whatever depth you set it at. And it's as simple as that, you can just have half a dozen floats out with all your baits on there, right? Um, whilst that's happening, I'm, I'm constantly spinning with um, the metals you've got in your bags. Um, I'm spinning with those all the time. I'm talking about spinning lures when we get to the lure section though, okay? <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, any questions on that so far in the float lining? Um, you can, no, I, I am, but with the pilchards on gangs, mate. Yeah. So I don't use half pillies so much. Yeah, because I find all live is down the bottom. So I've actually got, as I said before, live in the bottom, live in the zone where they are, because um, I come down the bottom and eat it, obviously. And you get this time you get snapper and you get cobra, you get everything on the bottom there as well as bycatch. And then you'll get, um, and then on the pillies I'm getting yellowfin and mackerel as well. Mm. Down and yep. Yep. Yeah, that's so right. So. Ah, uh, you just got to put a bit, bit bigger sink. You got to try and find that right size sinker to hold it at the depth. Mm -hmm. um, even if it's just straight down and can't go any further, it's just sitting there, it's like sort of dead sticking it. Yeah, that's right. So mackerel are different. Like snapper, they they're coming up and, and nailing it while it's sort of waffling down. Mackerel don't give a crap about that. They just see it and want to eat it. <laughs> they're very fast and aggressive. Different sort of fishing, but uh, which allows you to do that sort of, just hang them straight out of the side scenario. Yeah. Good stuff. Okay. Um, we'll put a couple of baits on, Stu, I think. Put a couple of baits yeah. on, mate. Yeah. Get the old specs out. Oh, you can re-get them. <laughs> some. So with the, um, yeah, we'll, do the, we'll, go back, we'll go back right to the start, guys. So with that bigger rig that's um, here and how to put a gar on. So um, it's still a bit frozen, but there's a little silver line along the edge of the gar, right? That's your dotted line, so to speak. And you get your fingers on both sides of it, okay? And just squeeze and it pops the flesh off the backbone. This is still frozen, actually. But it makes it a lot more softer. So if you don't do that, the gar is quite rigid. But um, if you push along there, just push down, push down, push down, push down. You'll hear it go pop, 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 and you actually see the, the flesh bounce up off the off the body. Okay, it doesn't make it softer. It just makes it doesn't make it um, explode easy in the water. It just makes it a lot more swimming type action in the water. So that's the first thing we do. The next thing we do, these are already pre-done, but if you catch your own gar, which we sometimes do in May if we're a late season mackerel um, in the broad water, catch a big seagull like this, um, you just get your thumb here and just push down and you squeeze all the poo tube out and all the like, green weed stuff comes out. You don't want anything in there because what happens is the water gets in the gill and then it pushes all that poo to the back and then it blows its backside out. And you don't want that, you want to be clean so nothing can, can get sort of pushed back. That's it, so it's got nothing in its gut. The next thing we do is we get the rig and um, we just sort of space it out. Sorry for the guys up the back, but you can watch this on, online, I guess. Uh, but you measure out so that hook, that little spike there is going to go in under here and out the top part of his head, okay? So like so. So I'm going to start my first hook off here. So the first hook is the only one that might be exposed out the side because there's, there's no body to put it into. So I just stick it out like so. Actually, I'll run it back a bit. Like so. And then the next one, make sure there's no scales on your hooks. When, what, whenever you're using bait, it's so important to make sure there's no scale on any of your hook because it won't hook up on the fish. And then this position here, I just get this spike and push it up through here. Just be careful not to stab yourself and out through the top just like that, okay? You can, you'll see it all when it comes around. And just hold it in position there and get that little spring. And it's got a little starting point on it. You just wrap the first little line through that wire there and then just screw it at the top of his head. Keep screwing up as tight as you can screw it until it can't go any tighter. 
And then, as Stewie said before, you just want to get that um, skirt down over the top so it keeps out all the water from getting in his mouth and gills and stuff. Just trying to get his legs caught up if you can help it. Now, with that little bit of wire there, if you want to just for safety reasons, you can actually bend that forward and then pop it into the skirt like so, like I've just done there, which I'll pass around in a minute. And it's happy days. Um, there's a couple of legs out there. I got caught up when I did that. When you put the bait in the water, it's really important you don't just throw out the water. Lower it in nice and gently. Gently, and uh, you'll see the. Oh, sorry, pop that out wrong. Yeah, that'll be right. So just like so, and that's it. And when you put that in the water, um, that I've actually got on that video that you'll see and it comes out in the weekend. You'll actually see the guard doing that through the water. That's how it swims, and you're pulling along like that sort of thing. And they just love. They really do like guards. Like probably my number one dead bait fish, more than slimies. Uh, I don't know if it's the smell or what it is about it, but they just like it a lot. Thanks, Drew. Right. Um, the next one we'll do is a pilly on the pilly rig. So, same scenario. So, this is your pilly rig here. Um, again, you just measure it out. The pilchers at the moment are fairly decent size, which I really like. So, that's really good. Uh, just measure it out so that goes through just in front of his eyes sort of thing. First one's going to start off roughly about there. So that's where I'm going to put it in. Like so. My dad, my dad used to put his pilchers on upside down. He'd do it through the top. And I know back in the day, back in the 80s, that was like the popular thing. Everyone did it through the top. I always like to do it from underneath. It's just personal preference. Same scenario. Oops. Just like so. And then just get that spring. Same deal. Screw it up on his head as hard as you can get it. Let's see that wire go. Just hold the wire there for your hand. Ultra sharp. This wire's a bit short. So when you make the wires, don't make them too long, don't make them too short, otherwise it doesn't quite, um, it'll be too long on the, on the fish or too short like now, it keeps popping off. But that's sort of the case. The pillies don't swim at all, it's just, they just work. <laughs> I don't know what it is. <laughs> Pretty plain Jane, but that works well. Um, I just might, if you don't mind, Stuart, to put... Uh, oh yeah, good idea. Yep. Okay, so this is a live slimy we've got here, but it's not very live at the moment. But <laughs> imagine it's a live slimy. Um, so slimies die really quick in your live well. Um, if you don't have a live well, you will need to get yourself like an aerator or something like that. Okay, in a big 20 litre bucket or whatever you got. Get a screw on lid so it doesn't splash later on. Because when the water gets out and there's not much water there, there's less oxygen, they don't die quicker. You want to contain the water in, the, in whatever you got. Um, and so you know that in your bait tanks, you'll get your bait, then you'll, sick of going out wide for the day, you get out there and it's like this much water in the bottom of your bait tank and they're all dead. They need to have water. So try and hold the water in the tank as much as you can. So a screw lid's really good. Just drill a hole and it drop your air hose in through the hole. Um, but that'll work better than nothing if you got nothing, if you have a live bait tank that's plumbed up with an aerator or a, or a pump. And they like them round. They're yeah, round. Round tanks. So yeah, cool. I know it's a bit of a stupid thing, but a lot of bait tanks are square, and the slimy in particular always just jam their nose in a corner and just drown. They just die. But um, yeah, if it's circular, they just swim around the happy hours all day. So slimies have like a dinosaur nose. It's really hard on the top, like a like a T Rex, so to speak. <laughs> Looks like a T Rex there at the front. Um, and then you, they got this little little hole that it's made for putting hooks through. Well, maybe that's what they think, but that's what I think. Um, and that just goes through like so, okay? And it's, it's, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, buddy. No, I don't. No, because it kills them, I think. That, I find that area, they live a long time. Um, sometimes I put it 
in here and out there, they're a little bit sort of half dead, because I tend to find it sort of holds it better in the current rather than this way. Um, but this way seems to work pretty good. Uh, it's really important though, that's why I like a little bit longer leader than what's on here, but obviously they're made for a smaller bait, but um, you don't want to pull that back to there and then put your, put your hook in, because it's sort of pulled from up there. It doesn't quite work the right way. So you need to have actually a bit of slack on this. You need to have actually bowed, so it's a bit, bit of a slack. So this is quite a big slimy actually, um, but that's okay, we'll make it work. So what we're gonna do is, if this is live now, I'd be quickly put that in his nose. I'll grab this fella here, and I will just, sorry guys, put it probably, um, probably inside. It's too short, so it doesn't go where I want to go. Probably just in here, probably in the top there somewhere. Somewhere where, it's, where they're gonna grab it and hopefully nail it and get hooked up, you know? So you've got to have two hooks exposed, really important. Don't put two hooks into the fish, just one, and make sure that that's not um, too tight on here so this can actually, you can actually still swim around and not get twisted up, like if you know what I mean. If it's too tight, it'll die quick. It's got to be able to do his thing, and this has got to be quite loose on here. So that's the point where you put it in. But this is not right. I'd rather actually have it down the back here and sticking out either side. Because you'll notice a lot of the fish you get, they get bitten off around this area here. So as long as it's about from where it is there to maybe his backside, that's about the, the area you want to have the, that last hook. Um, but guys, we'll have put two or three of these on. They'll put another one down the top here. So they've got two at the top, and they'll maybe put one right set down the back here. So they'll have three trebles hanging off, plus the one in its nose to swim on. Thanks, Stuart. And the last one to rig up is this little, this little one here, which is the, um, the one we're going to float line with. So float line is really, like I love trolling for Spanish mackerel and, and live baiting for them, but I love float line. I love catching mackerel. Like, have you seen the size of spotties this year? They're like bloody metre plus. They're, huge. They're as big as the Spanish. So you see guys on Facebook, they've got their two or three Spanish, and the spotties are the same size as the Spanish. And the spotties, a Spanish are eight kilo plus. So they're massive spotties. And normally, you know, you get them, 75, 80, or 90 might be a real big one. No, I think this year there's like many over a metre, or just on a metre, pretty huge. They go hard, they fight probably better than Spanish. So, uh, we haven't got two, have we got two of these, Julie, or what? No, that's okay. Um, scissors are good for cutting bait if you don't have knife. So, <laughs> we're gonna use the head part. So. I use a little 2 -oh hook. I, I love using, like I said, I use, like to use little hooks more than big hooks. They're more concealed than the bait and they never miss. Okay, so with a little 2 -oh hook, um, even that's a big bait, I, I'm nine out of 10 fish I catch, that'll be right down its gills. I mean, right down. And just that much of the wire be skin out of his mouth. So the problem with that is they pigtail up my, my trace and I've got to put another trace on, just, that's the way it is. But if I'm gonna go spotty fishing, I'll have at least 15 of those made up. So learn to make those yourself too. Whether you crimp it, whether you snell it, whatever you want to do, just um, do it properly. So just through the eye, pull it out, pull his eye out generally like I just did. Uh, it's 20 pound coated, that's correct. Yeah, actually, I think this one might be 30 actually. Yeah, that's 30. Yeah, 30, yeah. It's yeah. a very thin 30. Can you still smell the 30? Yeah. yeah. I'll pass it around and be able to see. Um, just put the bait, the hook in on the side there like so. Um, I would, I know on a snail you should have the tag fairly long, but I'd actually cut that a lot closer. I don't like it, that's too long for me. So I'd actually cut that, if this will cut it, yeah, it does good, shorter. And, uh, and that's just how it is. So um, as long as the current's not beaming, um, which it may then twist that in the current and do that in the water, which you don't want it to do. If it does any twisting, that, I don't know about it. It's got to sit in there naturally as you can do it. So how do we stop that from twisting? Um, has anyone ever used this stuff, bait mate? Fantastic stuff. So it looks a bit unsightingly on the fish now, but when it gets all wet, you don't see it. So you just wrap it round and round, and round and round. Oops, sorry. Obviously it's tied to your lines, that's a lot easier than now. But you can actually bring that trace up 
pretty tight on his nose there. He's going to load the, load the stuff. We'll have to give that away tonight. <laughs> Comes flavoured. And then you just break it off like so. Just pop it off like that. And it doesn't come undone, okay? But it keeps that all in line. Does that make sense? So what is it just like cotton? It's, it's like, like elasticised cotton. Yeah. It's cheap as like, I don't know, just five bucks or something. Yeah. Last year, whole season. Um, but it's just such a great thing. And when it's in the water, it actually goes like a purple colour, the bait colour. You don't actually see it. It doesn't, you don't see it at all. And um, it definitely keeps it all intact. And I just find it works really good for, especially, if, I don't use it much if I haven't got much current, I won't use it because I don't need to. It just sits there. But when there's current, I definitely use it just to hold it uh, straight on the bait, so to speak. Thanks, Stuart. And the tail one, when you're using the tail section, it's the same scenario. I've only got the one rig here, sorry, guys. But through, the, through here, out the other side, try not to break the skin either side of it. Pop the, the hook into there. When you do the bait, mate, you hold the line up here on the end up here on the tail and actually wrap the bait mate right up to the tail there and come back down again, snap it off and the line straight out through the middle there. It's perfect in the water. And I see guys, you anchor next to them, they're not getting any, but you look at your polarised and you can see their bait spinning and it just doesn't work. They don't like it. So you can't have any twisting. Yeah, really important. Uh, any questions on that at all, guys? No? Okay. Um, okay. I think that's still it on the baits. Yeah, any, is there any question on baits at all? Yes, sir. Quite often you'll see the blocks of pilchards. Yes. Okay. Um, all the pieces. Yeah. There's good blocks and bad blocks. <laughs> and I can't determine which ones we're going to get when we get. We get bait every week we run, because our freezers are small. Our bait turns over every week, it gets refreshed. And some weeks we will get crap bait and some yep. weeks we get good bait. Whereas and you buy a smaller bag. Yeah, you buy the two, or you get two kilo boxes of IQF, which is the same as the blocks. They're only they're a few bucks dearer, but the quality is really good, the IQF. You're better off doing those for your bait fishing, but for your burly, um, I suggest definitely not using those pilchers, use your blocks or whatever, or last, last week's pillies. Mm -hmm. Yep. When you cut your burly up too, guys, cut it small. Um, that section there. So, burley's the king. You, the more burley you put at the back of your boat, the more mackerel's going to be around the back of your boat, I promise you. You throw the burley out, straight away your four lines sitting there, they'll go rrr, rrr, rrr. You sit there, no burley, no throwing any burley out, and you might as well just keep talking to your mate if he likes talking to you, because you ain't going to catch much. <laughs> but I cut my slithers with a knife, but I'm cutting them about that size. So I'll get like 20 pieces off a, um, off a pilcher this size, you know? So it's true. But they're quite small. Like so, okay, like that size sort of thing. So you don't find them, like you say, a lot more sharks around the Oh, there are, but I don't think, I think they're eating more the fish than the bait. Yeah, you'll get always down a mermaid, as much like I remember when I was a kid, we've always caught little sharks, especially trolling those rigs, we've always caught them those rigs too. Um, down at mermaid mainly, and palmy. Um, but I don't think that's attracting the mackerel, not so much them. The mackerel attracting the sharks, yeah. yeah, right. yeah. Um, with the burley, try and be, uh, if you're the one cutting up all the burley, I know your lot, two rods might be there, try and be nice to your mate and throw it over his side too. <laughs> <laughs> I tend to throw more my side, but yeah. if you, you say, well, you cut up the bait, you can throw it your side, you know. <laughs> Someone's got to keep cutting the bait up, you've got to keep cutting the bait up. I would suggest doing probably two whole pillies, or if, you're, if they're taking, there's nothing two guys, you've got to put two heads out, two tails out. Sometimes they don't want to know about the tails, they want to know about the heads, and vice versa. You need to find out which way they're going to go for the day, and that's just the way it is on the day. And whichever is the opposite, use that cut up. Does that make sense? That's how it becomes a burly. Do you do a clean cut in your pillow, or do you A bit of an angle, a bit of an angle, yeah. 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 A bit of an angle, there's more gut to come out of it, it might be, yeah, definitely. Um, and yeah, so that becomes the burly. And uh, I suggest like probably putting out, say, two whole pillies about every 15 minutes or whenever they've gone quiet for maybe more than five or 10 minutes, if they were on the bike, you need to get some more stuff back out there again. Yeah. Okay. Um, that's probably better on the, on the bait, I think. Okay, uh, hard bodies. Well, hard bodies, um, another can of fish, can of worms. <laughs> there is so many different hard bodies, but there is probably six lures this year that are smashing it. Um, one of those you got in your bags. 
Um, there's a couple of different colours. Some guys have got the coral trout colour, some have got the blue colour. Um, now everyone's, at the moment, coral trout colour's been massive, but we took the blue one out the other day, I said, Stewie, the blue one kills it, because I remember last year we used it, and we straight away hooked up, yeah. straight away, <laughs> instant. And as soon as we put it, hit the water, we just put the rod holder, and it screamed off and got a, got a double hook up, actually. Um, so if you've got the blue one, um, you're going to be as good as the coral trout. Um, but if you are, after a second lure, get yourself a coral trout colour or get yourself a blue colour if you've got a coral trout colour. Okay. Um, Brand-wise this year, the ones that have been doing really well for us, and I, like the other day, my mate I went with Jace, he loves Helco. And um, at the start, he had two Helcos out and I had a Samaki and a Strata. The Strata's the one you got there. Um, and I think that was the day we got seven strikes that afternoon, eight strikes, um, hits. And um, before four, we landed four fish, we dropped one beside the boat. One nearly spilled us, and one other line crossed and got um, lost, and another one bit off. Anyhow, um, we, after the, the double hookup, then a double hookup, or triple hookup, I can't remember, um, one of the Helcos come off. He kept his red and white one on, and uh, I think he put a Samaki on. And then we got a triple hookup. And the Helco, we never got a hit on the Helco the whole day. We went out again the next day, we've used Helco. I oh, wouldn't use Helco, we used no. um, Strata and, and Samaki and triple yeah. hookup, double hookup. <laughs> so um, I don't know um, what your favourite are. We sell Helcos downstairs, don't get me wrong. Um, but they just don't get deep enough this year, that's what I believe. They're not getting deep enough. Um, you need that really big fat bib on the front, and it needs to get down around 10 or 12 metres. Six or eight's not going to really cut the grade that good. You also get fish on it, but you won't get as many. Using braid will get down deeper, like we talked about before. Using a lighter lead will get down deeper again. Can you use a downrigger? Yeah, you can use a downrigger. Problem is you can't use a deep diver on a downrigger. It tends to want to keep snapping the band. There's yeah, too much weight on it. Yeah, so you've got to use a, um, a shallow bib lure. Yep. Mm. The other thing too is you're trolling at six knots, um, and at that speed the ball's fairly out there too. <laughs> so you might as well use deep divers. Um, but guys, just a few little pointers is when you're dropping your lures out, really important to understand the placement of your lures behind your boat. So again, I'm coming up to that scenario. I'm coming up to my uh, plot we had before and I've got my marks on there and I know exactly where I'm going to start dropping my lures out. And um, behind my boat, this is my boat here, um, the, the, the rod hole there, I've got Two rod holes there and obviously two there. Um, this one here is going to be the one I'm going to drop out the furthest. And it's the first lure to go out. So I'll drop that one back 60 metres, OK? Um, then I'll drop this guy here out and I'll drop him out about 45 metres or 50 metres maybe. How do I know how far out it is? Because I use coloured braid. <laughs> so I just drop it back six colours or five colours. It's easy as. OK? And then this guy here about 40 metres and this guy here about 30 metres. Um, when you start trawling and they start diving down, this guy will come back to about here, this guy will come back to about here, this guy will come back to about here, and this guy will come, looks like they're going to be at the back of your boat because they're down deep. So um, when you're using deep divers, you've got a lot less chance. As I said before, when you're trawling baits, unless you're using downriggers, they're, they're way at the back here, so it's really difficult trawling around at speed with people coming behind you with baits, but with lures, they're just there. They're, they're, it's pretty hard to get a lure chopped off unless you dropped it out 100 metres at the start or 120 metres too far. You don't need to go that far. Sorry again, what speed were you using these at? Uh, six to seven knots. And the perfect speed the last couple of times about has been, if you can get it, 6.3 to 6.8. <laughs> if I go under that, I don't get much. If I go over that, they don't get much. Um, but it's hard to go down a swell, you know, pick up 7.4 and then you come up the swells like doing 5.6. You can't get it right, but when you do do that turn and it comes back whatever way it might be, that's a perfect scenario, you can get it right for a little while. Um, the thing is, you've got those out there. Now when you set your drag, um, we might just pull that line off this too if you don't mind, mate. When you set your drag, um, it's really important that you learn to, to feel the, where it should be right. Does it make sense? Rather than sitting at a scale and trying to measure it and that sort of stuff, it's different for game fishing and using light line and setting it for drags, whatever. Um, thanks, Drew. 
Is it tight, mate? Yeah, so, um, so Stu's probably got about right there, I think. So it's, yeah, probably just a tiny bit tighter, but you can just push the lever up a bit, whichever. Um, but you want to be able to grab it on, say, using a, I wouldn't use under 50 pound brake because the, the shock's too aggressive on it and it'll snap it. Uh, 50 and above up to 80 is fine. 80 pound braids thin and 30 pound mono, so it's pretty thin. Okay, uh, if you're using mono, I wouldn't be using much above 30 pound mono or maybe in that brand 50 pound, but that would be the maximum. But I try it on my eight kilo outfits too. But you just grab it and um, it should be set so it's like a, it's quite a firm pull. You are going to feel this later and you get understand what we're talking. We'll take it downstairs, you're going to play with it. But that's about the setting, we won't change that now. Um, and that's about where it should be on. So if it's quite easy, or if you're trolling the lures and you go down a swell and it gets a bit of speed up and it starts pulling off, it's way too light. When they hit it, it's not going to work, it's not going to hook up. It needs to be a bit tighter. But at the same time, if you get a hit and the rod goes like that and you snap the line, it's too tight, obviously. So you need to get the happy medium and just, just to grab it and a, and a nice tight pull out. Okay, that's it. Perfect, Stuart. Well done. Yeah, that's just it. Just a real quick one. If you do set drags on an overhead, always back it to leave the drag back to nothing first before adjusting our little dial. Um, just keeps everything. Yeah, it's when you set your lever drag to get it right setting. So if something you want to adjust a bit, if it's not, if it's too loose, even go all the way forward and it's still quite loose, you need to drop it back, put it in a free spool, hold the spool, and just um, turn that little preset button, like the steering side a little bit, and then do the same scenario again to get it right. Um, when you're dropping the lure out, leave the ratchet on. Okay, it's good to have the ratchet on when you drop it out, but when you get hook a fish up, try to remember to turn it off so your mates don't get upset. Um, but yeah, all oh, the video doesn't work out too good. Ours are always on. <laughs> but uh, so uh, when you put the ratchet on and it's dropping out, it just doesn't overrun. You don't get any dramas. If you've got a thread line um, and when you're dropping out even a, like a reel like that, um, I always point the rod at the lure. If you're trying to hold up like that, it, it's hard to get it going. It doesn't want to dig in. You want the lure to just put it in the water and straight away dig in and pull, start pulling the line off the reel. Does that make sense? Okay. And then you've dropped it back to the right depth and you've got the ratchet on and you put it in. Make sure your rod locks into the pin on your rod holder, whether it be a ski, jet ski or a rod boat, it has to lock into that pin. If you don't have a, um, a, a gimbal on the end of your rod, just make sure it's, it's sound, like it's tight in there, it doesn't get ripped out of the boat. Really important. I don't mind selling you guys rods and reels, but you don't want to lose it. <laughs> You can buy like a safety lacquer. Yeah. I think the Shimano ones are about three meters, ten foot. About yeah, quite long. Yeah. yeah. And just clip them on above the reel, not below it. Otherwise yeah. It'll slip off, but um, they're really handy. And if you've got a spin rod, Shimano do make a little, uh, a little brace. Put them down there. I think. Yeah. It's just like a little, um, a little crossover thing with two rings on it, and you slide it over the rod, above the reel. So you put, put, take the reel off, put that on, then put your reel back on, and then it sits in front of the reel, and then you just hook the safety harness onto the top of it. They're really good. Egg beater. So that jig type outfit there, um, you can trawl with, um, it has nothing on it, it's just a, a smooth bottom. So um, I'd be setting the drag on that a little bit lighter than my overhead so it doesn't get ripped out of the boat. Um, but at the same time, most of your rod holders, just the, the, the leverage on it, it works well. Does anyone use the side roll, rod trollers at all? The ones that sit flat? So they're really good to get your lines out a bit further and away from everyone else. Um, the other rod, sorry. Um, the problem is they're a little bit hard to get the rod out when you get the fish on because they're, they're sideways. So you've got to sort of pull it forward and then hook the fish up at the same time. Um, the secret with that would be, as with any of your, of your lines, as I, as I say, leave it in the rod holder and then slow the boat down to two knots and then grab it out. So the momentum and the weight of the boat going forward is, is enough to hold the fish on the, on the line. It won't pop off. You can get spooled though if you take too long but <laughs> it won't come off. Um, then I always rip into my fish. So when I get it out of the rod line, sort of in two knots, I give it a big yank and just really make sure that those hooks are in. That if it comes off, it's gonna come off anyhow. So I just really drive it home <laughs> um, and then play the fish in. Um, I leave, at least I was saying earlier, I leave at least one or two rods out, at least another one out at that two knots where you're playing the fish in, as long as it's away from that rod. And just that last week, I think we caught two more fish that were hooked up while we were playing the fish in. They hit the lure at two knots. 
So obviously he's got his mate with him and he sees something swimming along and he goes and nails the lure. Okay. Try and uh, get your lures to be all similar depths, but if you um, are going to run shallow lures, which I wouldn't recommend doing at this time of year because they're all going deep, but um, you're running your shallow ones and your smaller lures out the back further and your deeper ones in closer. Okay. Uh, no, not, not for mackerel. Um, they'll chew them up and uh, they'll probably bite it off. <laughs> um, but uh, you don't have the time. It's a bit more aggressive than when you're uh, marlin trolling. A lot more action. So except for some years the other day, maybe not. But generally it's pretty quick and aggressive. Yeah. So I think we hooked up within 20 seconds the other day. Yeah, it was pretty quick. We hadn't yeah. even got the four rods out. Mm. We were already mm. fighting two. So. Yeah. So... If I can suggest something else as well, um, when you're trawling, you might have your spots on your plotter that you normally go to, but if there's a, like 60 boats in that one area and they're all handing on top of you where you normally go, I would suggest if you've got a mark up here or down over there that's in a similar depth, head over there. Because the mackerel are everywhere. Like we've got customers getting up, up off the pin, halfway down, straight uh, down a burly, Q1, they're getting mackerel everywhere. They're not necessarily just there, but it is the, um, it's the lucky hole. Yeah, it's a, it's <laughs> it's a general a, it's, yeah. spot. Yeah, yeah if, you, if you had a, um, no other boats around, it guaranteed that spot to have it, that makes sense. But the other spot you may not be, but when you've got 60 boats here, you probably get more fish away from them, which is what we've been doing. So we haven't been going, we, we might trawl through them and maybe get a fish, but if, if there's, um, um, too many boats there. I'm out of that. I'm out of that area, and I'm looking in my other areas that I might have that I normally snapper fish, and the, the mackerel are schooled up there. Okay. Do mackerel care about current lines too much? No, not too much, mate. No, they they like clear water, and that's what I've said. If it gets dirty, at least they're down deep this year, not on the top. Unfortunately, part of the spotties they like the top, so they may not be around too much. Um, but the uh, Spanish mackerel, no, they. are they don't really care. Yep. The water temp the other day when I went out on the Thursday morning was 25.6 and the Thursday afternoon I got those strikes, it was 26.5 actually. Had it, I, it was more, I know it was a bite time that made it work that afternoon, not the bit of a spike in the water temp. But there's a lot of wahoo mixed in with us saying, saying earlier. The wahoo um, are just out there in, in phenomenal numbers and um, we've had a lot of customers catch them the last sort of three or four days or, or weeks though. Uh, the average size is around sort of 12 to 14 kilos with a couple of bigger ones amongst them. And uh, the, the way we got a wahoo the other day on, but we lost it, but they, they go a lot harder than a, um, and a Spanish. They go a lot faster. So it's really screaming out, like really screaming out. And um, Julian, oh, you hooked one the other day too, mate, didn't you? Yeah, I mean, do, do you have to rule regularly on like diamond? Or yeah. You do, but no, I've never seen them so early. Like, well, we get the odd one early, but not in the numbers that they are this year. Um, but uh, normally it's sort of late season, April, May, June. Um, but when I was up on the reef this year in uh, December, up between Airlie and Cairns, we did a trip up there for a week, and so many wahoo. Like, I, as I said to you, it's really, I said it's going to be a good wahoo season this year because I've never seen so many up there. So they're coming down now. Yeah, normally 50 metres. They're, they're on the outside edge of the 24s normally. Um, but we've got guys getting them at the moment on the 18s. So I think someone got one down at Palmy there a couple yeah. of weeks ago too. So they're everywhere. Yeah, they're early. Well, it's going to be a good season, one of the two. But they like really clean water as well. And they are a bit more on the surface than down deep. So um, hopefully we don't get too much rain because it'll scare them. But they're only, it's only early. It's early season. But just a long season, I think. And the mackerel this year are late. So it's all... Happening, yeah. Um, so get back. Matt, Sorry. Just, sorry, with uh, finding a small boat. Yes. Uh, army reef, like, how quickly depth do you look in there? Uh, about 20 metres, oh, it's about 12 metres on the north western corner. Yeah. Um, but yeah, 18, 16, 18, 20 metres. Yeah, mate, here it is. Then you sort of watch the Crumbin Bar though, um, particularly on as the tide gets a bit low because it's a little shallow. And you just about got to about walk your boat across, <laughs> sort of thing. Um, as long as you've got a, a motor that gets you on the plane reasonably quick, because you've got to, you sort of run the waves there side on. We used to go across there all the time in a 12 foot savage snipe with a 20 merc back in the day. That was good fun. But, uh, yeah. 
So if you've got something a bit bigger than that, you're right. <laughs> yeah, but don't, I wouldn't go across there if the swell's more than about five foot. Yeah. yeah. Or four feet, yeah, 1.2. Yeah, so from the seaway down to um, Palmies, if you've got, say, a boat four and a half metres and a 50 in the back or something like that, it's, yeah, it's a long way. It's about a, at least a half hour run. But you know, it's a half hour in your car to get down there, right? So similar, um, just a bit bumpier. And you don't want to do it if it's going to be expected 20 knot northerly coming up because there's a shit trip back. So <laughs> stay away from that. Uh, Southerly's not too bad. Yep. And um, Mermaid, well, Mermaid hasn't been fishing that good this year. I don't know why. Um, it's like one of my favourite honey holes, you know, but this year it's been quiet. It's been Palmy or Southport. Gravel Patch has been not too bad as well. And, uh, and further north. Yeah, so I don't know. Um, uh, getting back to the hard bodies, um, stick with really deep divers. Um, as I was saying before, like these guys say they get down about. Um, well, they don't say where they get down, but I know they get down about 10, 12 metres. That's the strata. Um, the Samakis will tell us they get down. Like 8 to 10. 8 to 10, is this true? Mm. Yeah. Oh, yeah, 8 to 10 metres. But because we're running braid, that's, that's on the worst case scenario. So that's running them in close and probably on 50 pound mono. But when you're running on braid, light leader, a bit further back, um, they get about half that depth again. So if they say 10, I'm talking 15. This guy's 10 to 12, but talking up to 18 metres. So they're getting right down there. And you see the angle, the line, it's way out there, but when it hooks in and you start driving at six knots, it goes like that. And the rod's are really bending over, working really hard. Okay. Mm. Um, I, run, I tend to run around, around 60 pound fluorocarbon, or 50 pound. Yeah, 50 is like the really perfect size. It get it really swimming nicely, which I think you guys got. I think it's in the bags what I use. Yeah, you got 50 in there as well. So that's fluoro, yep, run about a metre and a half long, something like that. Yep. If you're running a braid straight to that with an oil braid, I'd probably run about three metres long, or two metres, just to give it a bit of shock. Because uh, fluorocarbon doesn't have the same stretch as mono does. It's quite aggressive as well. So if you've got aggressive braid and aggressive short leader and that, uh, it's only the rod tip that'll move. <laughs> All the fish's mouth when it gets hooked gets ripped out. So uh, you need to run a bit longer lead. It has a, li a little bit of elasticity in it. Yeah. Like three, four metres or something like that? Uh, three metres is good, yeah. Three metres. Yeah, two to three metres, yeah. Two minimum. Um, getting back to colours, as we talked about before, um, the two coral trout colours have been exceptionally good, which is those two colours there. That's Samaki and that's the, um, the Strider. Um, Josh, who does the Samaki lures, um, he's been smashing and a lot of other customers too on that colour there, which is a blue mullet. I think it's called a pink mullet. Yeah, it's yeah. got pink bottom, blue top. Um, and some of the live flight colours, like the red mullet, the slimy and the yellowfin have been really smacking them as well. I'll pass these few around, you can have a look. Um, in the Rapalas, the Rapalas were doing really well as well, but you've got to go to 30 or to 40 because it needs to get down 30 or 40 feet. That's what it means in the, in the Rapala terminology in the X-Rap. Um, Colour-wise, this year, as I said before, it seems to be red and oranges that are doing really well. Um, they do the, the squid colour and the red mullet. Um, both these are, are really good. Trouble with the Rapalas, they're a little bit hexy in price, but they're a good lure, eh? Although we got bitten, my, I took a mate out on Monday and he just put his Rapala out and straight away got bitten off and my coral trout one got bitten off. And I was like, I felt vulnerable because I didn't have any more coral trout on stage. <laughs> so anyway, I stuck out, I, I don't know what I stuck out. Um, oh, the purple one. Purple one yeah, yeah, purple one. That caught fish straight away, so I was, I was happy again. The purple strata. Um, so you just sort of, every year um, it seems to be a little bit different, but for the last three or four years it's been orange. Orange has been the killer. Has anyone caught, um, used orange much? Who's used orange the last few years? Okay. Uh, did you catch many fish on the other colours you've been using? Like blues or... No. Nah. Stick with the colours that you have. You know, they look natural. Yeah. 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 yeah, but try orange, trust me. Orange or red. It's incredible. Yep, they all work, and there's a trillion different colours. That's actually not, that's actually um, not a bad colour too. On there, it's green. Um, this like psychedelic colours 
I'd reckon they'd probably work too. But the traditional, except for that fusey, that fusey's been smacking it, but I think it's because it's got the green chartreuse on it. Uh, I've caught a few fish on that as well already this year. Um, but traditional blues and stuff like that have been a little bit quiet, except for the yellow yeah. colour. Yeah. Yeah. Um, as I was saying before, if you're going to run smaller lures, the only time I'd run smaller lures is using smaller line. So it's the same scenario. If you're running, say, um, let's just say that, that little egg beater there with 4,000 with 20 pound braid on it, and you're going to run maybe a, take a punt and put 30 pound um, leader on the front or 40 pound fluorocarbon, um, you'd probably get this little lure here which says it goes down to four to eight metres. Oh, yeah, four to, or four to six, you'll probably get it down about 10 or 12 metres if you drop it back a bit, maybe six to 80 metres back. And it'll pull up to about probably 40 metres behind the boat, but it'll get right down there. So if you only got little rods, um, that's the scenario you want to run, something like that. Still got a big bib on it, um, and it'll get down deep. There's another new one too. I haven't tried this yet. You haven't tried this yet, Stuart? No. So these are a cheaper version of some markies, so to speak. They're called... Fish craft. Um, this fellow is meant to get down uh, 10 metres, which is pretty good. It's got a very similar bib to the Deera Samaki, but these are only like 15 bucks your price sort of thing, so they're cheap. Um, they do a really good range of colours. They do a mullet too, I think. Um, somewhere downstairs. <laughs> but uh, that one's um, like a cheaper lure alternative that would work all right, I think, and get down there. It'll probably get down around 10 or 15 metres. And there's an array of different lures, guys, eh, um, that'll work. Um, these trick baits, this is a, a lure that Shimano done a few years ago, the Japanese made. They're really beautiful lures. They do an array of different colours. Um, and we talk about, like, when it's blowing, say, 15 knots and you're on the way out to the reef, and you know it's mackerel time, and you've got a chance to catch your mackerel as soon as you get to the side of the seaway, right, at this time of the year, all the way out to wherever you're going inside of 50 metres. So... If you're doing like 15 knots and it's like bang, 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 you're better off putting the lure out the back at 15 knots. Okay? And you, you, you've got to run it on about probably at least 50 pound though, because otherwise just the drag at that speed is quite aggressive when you get the hit. But Wahoo love it, okay? Wahoo love it the most. Spanish mackerel, I've caught up to 12 knots, and then caught it 15 knots, but Wahoo you will. Um, and other tuners as well. But that type of thing there, uh, are really good, as are some of the Helcos um, in the Bibless type minnows. And if you've got a heavy type outfit like a, a 50 pound or 30 pound mono or 50, 80 pound braid, you can run a big fella like that at the back. So how these work is you drop it back about 60 metres, quite a far, fair way back, and they just swim like that, really tight, um, about a metre below the surface. And they're doing 15 knots. So you need to set your drag fairly tight, otherwise it'll just keep pulling off with the pressure. But when that fish hits at that speed, um, by the time you slow down a bit, don't just stop it. By the time you slow down, they've probably ripped off another 150 metres in that th three seconds, because that's the momentum speed you're going, right? So you need to make sure you get more than, more than at least 300 metres of line on your reel. Otherwise your backing will be out there and it's all gone. Um, let's drill pass those around. But definitely, um, if it's a bit rough, Think about just chucking a lure at the back and put the rod holder rather than wasting the time. And it's really good too if you're going out wide for the day, marlin fishing, whatever, and it's a crap trip out. At this time of the year, you should always have a bibless lure at the back or a skirt, or like a wahoo skirt. And a skirt yeah. you can draw with your Yeah, yeah, wahoo, the metal head, like a, metal like, um, like a hex head style. Yeah, like that style of thing. Yeah. Yeah. Drop it back about 100 metres. Uh, Wahoo, the, the happy Wahoo speed, we're actually doing a seminar on Wahoo coming out soon, but it's um, around about 12 knots, which is about 20 k's an hour. Yep. So up on the plane, pretty well. Yeah. Um, any questions on the hard bodies? All good? Okay, you know where to place them, you know what to do, get out there and throw them out, and if you're going to go bait fishing, you're still throwing hard bodies out, okay? Did you try go more with the current? Or? Yeah, so. The best thing about enclosed is the current doesn't run too much. And it's very, um, thanks Matey for doing that. It's very um, changing. Like the out wide, it's always running south, right? 
It's just the speed slows down or goes fast. And for those of you who do go wide, just let you know the current is dropping off next week. I just looked at the chart this morning. It's dropping back to about one knot. It's been running like two and a half knots forever. It's dropping back um, a short period, I'd say. Uh, but in close, mate, yeah, like we were out there a week and a half ago, it was running north. Uh, so when I was trolling south, I was doing, um, I don't know, about um, four and a half, five knots. And when I went north, I was doing seven knots. So I was running like you know, two knots to the north, which I've never seen much very often. It normally means not very good fishing, by the way. That was the day I got bitten, my, my bait got bitten off. Um, that was about three weeks ago, early season. Um, okay, many years ago, and still these days, um, we used to go up Stratty. I don't know if you've ever been up there back in the old days, if any of you guys are here from a long time ago. Um, I talked about 15 years ago, before they made a little green zone on Stratty. It was the best mackerel fishing ever, okay? So anywhere from um, Karaji to Tipplers, it's all coffee rock in about 12 metres of water. And the Spanish and Spotties still do get in there. And the water's just like a frothing washing machine. And you used to throw metals like these in there and just actually have a field day. Or we troll baits or troll hard bodies and smash the, the Spanish. Um, troll is all green zone now. So you can go up to the um, blocks and troll around the blocks there. But you can't go another sort of 500 metres north in, in the green zone. You've got to go out to about 40 metres deep. And you will get mackerel out in 40 metres deep. Um, and that goes all the way up to the pin bar pretty well, just before the pin bar. Um, but down this end of town, um, we get um, spotty mackerel when the water's clear, which is maybe gone for a few weeks. <laughs> but um, when the water's, when you're travelling down to Mermaid and you see a bunch of birds, or when you're going back home at 9 or 10 in the morning and you see a bunch of birds, which sometimes on a real clear day look like a a cloud on the horizon, but they're actually birds. Um, there is always spotties and tuna in amongst them. And just using a spin outfit like any one of those bottom two there, or anything you got at home, your flatted outfit, it doesn't matter, it's such a buzz. Um, just hook up a 25 to maybe a 40 gram or a 60 gram if you've got a bit of wind, and the line's a bit heavier. So um, ready to go. So have your two spin rods. So as soon as you get down, before you go down to do your um, mackerel fishing, have two spin outfits set up on the way down. And on the way back, cut off your two of your pilly rigs and put on two medals ready, just in case you see something on the way back. Because you haven't got time to do it in the frustration and stress period of seeing all these fish zipping around everywhere. And by the time you get your lures out, get a bit of plastic off the hook and tie in your leader and tie this on, and you look up and there's nothing. And it's like crap. But if you got this ready set up, you just grab your rod and you zoom in there, go upwind, always go upwind of the, of the fish around the other side of them and come down the wind and cast into them. They'll, they always head into the wind, you always go down with the wind, so you meet up eventually, right? So that's how you do it. Um, and that's the sort of thing that we, that we use. Okay. Um, I think you got a couple of those in your bag as well. There's a 25 and a 40 grammer. And, um, there's an art to using these. Um, you will lose a lot, okay? So when they're really on, has anyone ever had that experience yet when the spotties are on like that? I wish you did. It is the best. Like, I mean, out of all the macro fishing, it's the number to do it. Yeah, I understand, <laughs> so, it's very addictive. Yeah, very, very addictive. Um, when they're on, it's seriously like the size of, say, an oval, average size is about an oval size, of just white water, birds. And, and if they're jumping, they're tuna. If they're zipping, zipping through the water real fast, there's spotties, or Spanish with the spotties, and probably sharks in there too. Um, and uh, so you just go up, we like I say, and just be cool, don't go, go straight through the middle and cast, go around the other sides, you get longer period with the, with the fish then, and, and just cast um, into them and let it, so cast it out. The golden rule is um, the guy who lets his lure sink a little bit gets the first fish or the most fish, but he also gets bitten off easier. So if you just cast it out, so hits the water, start spinning it, it'll start flipping the surface and do all weird things, and it's not as attractive to the fish. But if you let it sink, it's only going to get bitten off because they'll see it free falling, and they'll just go and nail it and bite you off. You got to start spinning. There's nothing there. Or if you do didn't get bitten off, and as soon as you start turning it, it's so natural in the water, you'll just hook one straight on, straight away. And if it falls off, and you're fighting it, and it falls off, just start spinning again, so you get another one straight away. That's how aggressive they are. Um, 
And it's just such a buzz. Yeah. <laughs> you got to go and do it. But we will get that scenario as long as we don't get too much rain and it's clear water. And it's always within uh, inside of 30 metres. I've never seen it out in 40 metres of water ever. So it's always in close, right up to the edge of the beach. And the spotties will go right to the shark nets. Okay. So, uh, so uh, I, never, I never been fishing before. Okay, good. Okay, you still learn a lot tonight. Uh, so the mackerel, so for this type of scenario, anywhere from in front of the seaway, sometimes they're in front of the seaway, mm -hmm. right at the front, especially on the run out tide, um, all the way down to Palm Beach. Like Burley's a really good area. Uh, Mermaid Beach is normally a good area. And before Mermaid in front of Q1, there's a bit of coffee rock there in about 15 to 20 metres deep. Mm -hmm. Coffee rock's like a little bit of reefy bottom and it holds the bait and then the fish come. Mm -hmm. And you just look for the birds, birds diving. And then if you watch, um, what happens, the mackerel down deep, but when they get the bait to come to the top, that's when it all happens. That's when they go crazy. Yeah. Chicken question. Uh, I only got uh, four points. It's fine. Yeah. How does it go to Palm Beach? Uh, so Palm Beach Reef, um, to be honest with you, Palm Beach Reef is a really good spot, say, in uh, December and early January, but it gets less fish now. The fish all happens up this area. So it always starts at Palm Beach Reef and then it progresses normally Mermaid and Southport. Southport always starts about February normally, it started earlier this year, um, and it goes right through to April, May, June. So just stay at the front here. You don't need to go to Palm Beach. Yeah, and too many boats. <laughs> too, many, too many cranky locals. <laughs> so, but uh, if you've got a day where the swells may be less than a metre and the, not too windy, and you don't mind towing your boat down to Crumbin, try and get it when high tides may be about eight or nine o'clock. So if you go out at this time of year, it's daylight at 5.30 or it is. So you go out at say five o'clock, it's sort of ready to come in a couple of hours so that it's deep enough normally to get over the bank. Uh, and you need to be able to see the waves because they break there. You have to go over the white water, so be very careful. Uh, and run alongside, don't go straight into it, go along, head north normally. And um, and then when you come back in at nine o'clock, it's tides, high tide's just gone, it's not too bad. But if you've got low tide at eight o'clock in the morning, uh, it's very terrible. Because um, you can get stuck out there. And if it comes up windy or stormy, you can't do anything. You can't come back in because it's too shallow. Yeah, so be careful to, to get the tide right. Speaking from experience from my younger days. <laughs> um, we had to come in through Telebudger a couple of times and that was even worse, I think. Yeah. Um, but anyhow, so 25 to 60 grams. Um, my suggestion is if you're only running uh, 15 pound braid, it wouldn't run much lighter than 15 because a lot of fish you just won't get in or you get spooled because most of your little lines have only 150 metres of braid. So they'll take that out easy if, if it's a eight kilo fish or something. So um, stick with 25 to maybe 35 on that size. Um, if you're running 20 pound braid, you can run 25 gram up to about 50 grams. If you run 20 pound braid. If you're running 30 pound braid, you can still run 25s, but up to 60. Okay, Let's stick with that. Um, you saw that braid going around earlier, so you see the difference in the two thicknesses. So same deal on the casting. So um, if you're running a normal, uh, say, 30 pound braid, you're going to see that stuff in 30. It's like 15. It is 15 actually. So 30 pound braid, um, it's quite thick, and if you want to cast a little 25 gram lure a little bit of wind, or whatever it might be, it's it's not going to get the distance very well. You need to get distance when you're doing this sort of thing. Um, but if you've got the 30 pound braid in the thin 15 pound diameter, it's going to just hoik it out there, you know, so far, double the distance. Yeah. When you're spinning two, um, so as I said, count one, two, three, four, five, go. Start spinning and start spinning quite fast and then just stop. As soon as you feel it coming to the top, just stop for like Half a second, so like that, then wind again, like stop, just like that. Just that little pause is when they nail it every time. Okay, if you just do a constant wind, you'll still get fish, but you won't get as many. So try that trick if you can. But it's quite hard, as Stu knows. Yeah. <laughs> it's quite uh, frust uh, not frustrating. It's like excitement and uh, and because it's you see them chasing after, they're crashing. It's very hard to actually pause because you know you get nailed or bitten off. Or yeah, you don't whatever. want to stop, but you should. Yeah, you should. Mm. Make, make yourself stop. Quite hard. Okay, rod holders, um, twiddle tools. Um, 
if I chose the Spanish mackerel, I suggest maybe having some sort of rod holder. It is a bit hard on you if you've got more than one fish. By the time you get the third fish in, it's um, a bit sore. Um, the tools, okay, they have really sharp teeth, guys. And the mackerel this year are really slimy. For those of you who caught one this year, you'll know how slimy they are. They're really slimy. So it hits the deck, you gaff it, you pull it in the boat. I'll talk about gaffing in a moment, but you pull it in the boat and then um, they uh, hit the deck and the floor, like you just walk past where it was and you just fall on your ass. It's really slippery. So um, you need to do the right thing, which is not to get it on the floor. <laughs> if you can help it, it's pretty hard. But when you've got two or triple, or like two or three fish hook up, they have to get on the floor or straight to a bag or something because you've got to yeah. get the gaff for the next fish that's your mates to hurry up. So um, with the gaffing, I'm going to gaff this to it, right here, mate? There's one here, yeah. yeah. So um, it's a couple of tricks. If your mate's at the back of the boat here, that's the transom, that's the side of the boat, and he's playing the fish and the final the fish is getting that close, first thing you have to do is when, when it's within sight is just back the drag. But if you've got to leave the drag just a little tiny bit or if you've got a star drag, it's maybe a half a turn. Just enough so if it wants to take off under the boat or around the motor, it can do it without pulling your rod into the motor or without um, snapping the line under the boat. It needs to be able to pull the line off the reel. That's the first case of stopping you from losing a fish. Second thing is, get your mate that's got the fish on the rod, get him to, to work his way up to the front or the middle of the boat a little bit, up towards the, where the steering wheel is, and you come in behind him where he was standing, and the fish is now there, and just gaff it, okay? When you gaff it, have your donger, I haven't got one here somewhere, we've got downstairs, but have it close by. Um, when you gaff it, so I'd normally uh, lead it, use my right hand, gaff it, and then lift it into the boat straight away, and be very careful, try and gaff it in the head part, because the head part you've got more control, okay? If you gaff it in the middle, his head's snapping around, trying to bite you. And they're, they're very sharp teeth, I mean like you just touch her and just slice it right open. So, you got him in the head part, his head's here, it's whack, whack, whack in the head. Um, make sure that you don't hit the boat or hit your mate or hit your hand or whatever. Hit him in the head and then um, put him straight, if you can, then straight into a, a fish bag or a well or, or an esky or something, okay? And get ready for that next fish that your mate's got on, hopefully. Because that's going to do the same scenario. If you drop it on the floor, it gets slippery. And then when you start, it's there, it's very dangerous around your feet. And sometimes they're still a little bit alive and they will cut you, bite you and you'll slip over and fall on top of it, whatever. So try not to get on the floor of the boat. If you do, you have to wash it off straight away with a, or wipe it down with a rag, whatever. It's really dangerous. So it's um, slippery. Julian, how'd you go getting it on the ski? Julian's on a ski the other day. So if you see, see a guy paddling out the other day, it was Julian. Out. Did you get 18s or 24s, mate? I was at 18 fathoms. 18 fathoms. So hand paddle out to the 18s and he got a mackerel. Yeah. So I basically the, the fish was tired, I gave it like a swing. Mm -hmm. So it shot past me, I grabbed the tail and missed it in the yard. Oh well done. <laughs> <laughs> so for those of you on a ski, that's how you do it. <laughs> well done, Matty. I was very proud of you because I know Julian's been trying to get him for a few years now, right? A couple of years. Oh uh, no, just this season. Oh this season was it? Oh okay, right, okay. That might be another guy as well. But anyway, well done. Hey yeah, good. So I, I said even don't go to the diamond, it's too far out to paddle into the diamond reef. <laughs> but um, he was determined to get out there and get one. That's good. But anyhow, make sure you gaff sharp, make sure the rubber thing's off the end of it when you go to gaff it. Um, so someone asked before about getting your line down. There's, there is another way it's called a planer board, which is this thing here. So that's what all the pro mackerel fishermen use up north. It's a, a board that's designed to get your lures down around those three sizes. Each size goes down like another 10 metres. So that size actually get it down like 30, 40 metres. It gets it right down, like probably going to dig in the bottom. But there's two problems with it. One is um, they get, sometimes they can bite this because it's quite flicky in the water, right? And they're biting anything at the moment because they're hungry. Um, the second thing is you've got to run your line off the back. You can have a trip, a trip line off there with a, um, like how we said before, with like a downrigger system, like a hand reel or another rod and you have a little piece of line at the end here, you put a rubber band your line and hook it on and drop them both down together. So you drop this down while you're in neutral and your line goes down with it 
and then you put it in the gear and go forward, and then just the momentum will keep this down in the area, right? Uh, it won't come back to the top, it stays down there. Um, and as soon as you hook the fish up, um, it, it'll pop off the end of this. And you just have to, sometimes the hand wind up by hand, and then you um, play the fish in. The other way is you actually attach it to your lines if they do up north, but that they're running like a cord uh, off the top of this ring here at the top, and they're running a, a very short wide trace at the back with their, with their bait on it. As soon as you hook the fish, this flips over, and it has no drag on in the water at all. You don't actually even know it's on the line. You're fighting the fish. But it, his mate can maybe bite it while it's on the line, because it's, it's flicking around while he's, the fish is fighting on your line, OK? Uh, you're using that with bait and not with lures. But there's three sizes. That's the biggest one. That's the small. So you're talking like 10, 20, 30. There's actually, I think there's one in between these two. Anyhow, that one gets down about 30, 40 metres. Um, so that's an alternative to try, but there's an art to using them, and, and it does work really well once you know how to do it. Um, knives, make sure you've got a decent felt knife for felting mackerel. Their, their flesh is quite deep, as you know. Um, keep them on ice. They're really good eating. They've got very white flesh. Um, they, I don't know how you guys cook your fish, but um, we had some last night. Um, it's the, the, I cut the fillet in half, or Stuart does the same too. Actually, Stuart filled some of ours the other day. <laughs> and um, cut it in half, and obviously skin it, take the center bones out. And it's just this big, like a fillet, a rib fillet side of the fish, uh, but the top section. And um, put it in like that sort of size into a fry pan. I don't know if you guys like, like um, two ways you can do it. One is with uh, like just sweet and sour um, sauce. Uh, so sweet chili sauce, sorry, <laughs> sweet chili sauce. Uh, and so you actually cook it in uh, butter, a bit of garlic and salt and pepper, and just sear both sides until it's like half cooked both ways, just the middle raw. And at that point, then you put um, chili sauce over the top and turn your heat right down to, to a lot less. Put the lid on the fry pan and sort of baste it, if that makes sense, and then flip it over the other way. So it gets sort of like a, uh, a hard um, sweet chilli sauce layer on both sides, but when you crack it open, it's just like super moist, and you pull the sauce over the top. Really nice. Do the same thing with balsamic vinegar. So you do the same thing rather than add the chilli, add the balsamic vinegar at the last part, and just let it simmer in it at very low heat for about another five minutes, and then turn it over. And it also puts a film on it hard, and when you crack it open, it's just white flakes, big white flakes. It's really nice. Rather than beer batter or whatever the normal thing you do. So how long do you keep it uh, when you when you put it in the uh, put the lid on? How long do you? Uh, about five or ten minutes, just enough to really moist it up. Yeah, it's really good and low. So I'm I'm on high heat for the first ten minutes. That's five minutes outside, five minutes outside, or three minutes, three minutes, and then switch it around to like twenty percent power or ten percent power, and put the lid on. Yeah, really good. Add add the sauce at that point, and make sure you do both sides. Yeah, really good. Mackerel's beautiful deep. It's as simple as that. And they're such a uh, a good yield because they're, they're a small head and they're big. <laughs> so they're good yield. <laughs> Spot is even better. Do they freeze or? Yeah, they do freeze. So I, I, like, I'd highly recommend any fish to cry back it, 100%. Yeah. So if I'm going to cry back it, get one. And that's with all fish. It's so, so good. And we're still eating fish from like, the reef we caught last September, last, the year before yeah. last. And it's still fantastic, you know? Yeah. Okay, um, I think that's about nearly it. Anything else to talk about, Stu? Yeah, yep. Oh, just a little thing. Bait net. Like, for those of you who are going to use live bait, um, you all know, how, like, a, half the time I forget my bait net. All, all the kids have been playing with it and have lost it. It's not in the boat. And I'm like, crap. And you're like chasing around the tank, chasing around the tank, and it's like really hard. And then you get really mad, you start to grab, and then they spike the crap out of you. And you had the same problem all the way through. It's just it's much easier to scoop. Get yourself a little scoop. Keep it hidden so the kids can't find it. Um, we'll get one for the kids as well. I think that's about all the things I'd show you. Yep, that's it. Okay. Oh no, there's one more thing. With your medals. Okay. As I said, if if those mackerel on and they're football field size and they're just exploding everywhere, and, and we're going to get a bag limit in no time. I, I promise you. Everyone in the boat's going to be hooked up. It's just that full on. And it happens happened last year, it happens every year. It really does happen up the pin bar, I didn't talk about that, yeah. but the pin bar, if you get a chance to go that way, which is about as far as going to Palm Beach, that way you go that way. <laughs> about 20 k's, jumping pin. 
but you go from, it's a bit of a rough bar most times, so unless the swell is really small, you can get the broadboard and go out, but generally go from the seaway up. And um, it's about 20k run. Um, but if you can get the tide there, um, try and get low tide about four or five in the morning, probably about four o'clock, and you need the tide about two hours after low, when the dirty water's pushed right back into the edge of just behind where it breaks. And what happens is you get that clean water and the dirty water as it's pushing into the, to the bar. And in that edge, all the way along that edge, it's in about I don't know, probably 10 or 8 to 12 metres deep. You're outside behind where the waves are breaking. But it, it, I don't know where they come from. All these little like, white bait just rock up. And it's like two kilometres around the whole edge. And all the baits in there and all the birds are in there and all the spotty mackerel in there and Spanish mackerel. We've even caught wahoo in there at times. And um, it's a great place. You'll just see them. They'll just get the bait to the surface and there's a big explosion on the surface and, and it's all metals and it's a really good thing. And the mackerel are there at Rangs, we've got a customer in today, so got something there a couple of days ago. So they're there too, so sometimes it's worth taking the effort up to drive up there and have a look. Yeah. Okay, um, but getting back to those metals, um, in a session, a solid session, uh, if you had three guys spinning, it'd be nothing to lose, eight lures or 12 lures between you. You can have a safeguard, which is something like this little thing here. Um, these are titanium. So they don't ever kink. Um, they have a tiny little bit of stretch. And hopefully you don't snap it off. The only way you lose it really is if you um, cast incorrectly and snap your line, your braid or whatever. But they, um, they don't kink. No matter how hard I bend it, it this pops back out again, the titanium. And the, the um, fittings on are really good too, but they're expensive. They're like around eight bucks a pop. But you won't lose your lure. It's very hard to bite titanium. Okay, I'll pass that around. Yeah, Julie? Uh, well, we never like that the, the, the wire used for the killer. Yeah, you can. Yeah. So, um, it's Hel Helco actually do it, Julian. They, this is a um, 44 pound one. This is a little, this is a little um, bite trace as well in single strand um, and it has the fast attach clip so you just hook the lure in like that very quick and easy and that's a cheap alternative which would work really well as well they're about 12 bucks or something like that, 11 bucks for a packet of five so two dollars each yeah and that would be a safeguard when they're on the chew they don't they don't really care they, they'll just they're just looking for that flash going through the water and stopping um, so i would definitely attach it then but when they're quiet and you're spinning the abyss, um, I wouldn't be abusing fluorocarbon. Yep, I'm trying to get one. Or, or spinning a burly trail. Um, unless I'm getting constant hookups, uh, I would be using fluorocarbon. Uh, get more would bites. You, uh, you can do that as well. They make a heavier version as well. They make a 30 kilo job, so for lure fishing as well. They are definitely like the, the, the bee's knees, yeah. And they're petite, so all they see is the lure swimming, you know? Yeah. Uh, and why that? Uh, it does a little bit. Um, I used to use wire years ago because I was a bit tired on lures. <laughs> but then I realised I wasn't getting many fishes than other guys, so I haven't used it for years. Uh, uh, yeah, that's right. <laughs> I owned a fish shop back then too. But, <laughs> but um, anyhow, it's um, it's much more um, advantageous to run throw a carbon and lose the odd lure. Although in saying that, I've lost four or five lures this year. You know. Oh, it's after nine o'clock. Sorry, guys. Time goes quick. We're having fun. Okay. <laughs> so, any questions at all? Any any more questions, my friend? Any questions at all, folks? I really appreciate you guys hanging back tonight. Really, really good. Um, we'll do the draw now. Time goes quick. Mm. Holy jeez. Okay. So, tonight's draw. What we're going to do um, is we're going to draw out um, the prizes. Six prizes. First to six, and then we're going to. Put all the numbers back in here, and we're going to draw out. Um, we're going to take a mate fishing for the morning. So one of you guys will win a trip out with Stuart and me for a quick fish. <laughs> That's random. I didn't tell. Down. I didn't tell Stuart about this. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so that just as a mate. So we're not. Yeah. You don't. It's not a. It's just a. We're giving to to a mate. For for um, insurance purposes. That's how it works. <laughs> we don't know who you are. Just come out. For, for a trip. Um, so it'll be probably um, maybe next Wednesday morning because the weather looks good then if you can get the Wednesday morning off. If you've got to work, like we've got to work too, so we 
probably be back in before 8 o'clock. And we probably go out at 5. And only one person can come. So sorry if you've got a mate, but that's how it works. Okay, we'll put all the numbers back in at that time. Does that sound nice to it? That's good. Yeah. Uh, lucky number five. Number five is number one first prize drawn. Yeah. Which would be one of... Is that you, love? You five? Yeah. Good on you, though. Good on you. Yeah. Well done. Thank you. Okay, number two. If there's still a couple hundred bucks worth, we'll go to Stewie. You got the numbers over there, mate, the spare ones. Number 11. 11, yeah. middle area. Yeah. <laughs> well done, mate. Good on you. Thanks, mate. Okay, we'll go for number three, which is I think about 150 bucks worth or close to it. So it's about 900 bucks for the gear tonight at retail. 